Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Today's study is going to be a long one. I might break it into two parts depending on how long it is, but it's called Are You Ready? Okay. This is going to be a two-part series. I'm going to do Are You Ready? and Are You Looking? Okay. And it's all about when Jesus comes. Are you ready? All right. So make sure you get out your King James Bibles, God's perfect written word in the English-speaking people. If you want to call it authorized version, okay. All right. The authorized King James Bible for English-speaking people. It's God's perfect written word in English. I think I got all the bases covered. Um, but Brother Jesus Christ, I'm looking out there, and I'm just wanting to encourage you, Brother Jesus Christ. This study is going to be convicting me as much as it's going to be convicting you. Okay, and that's the whole point of this study. Okay, we're going to go through a checklist. Uh, there's many checklists. So like I said, we might do more studies after this, but there are many checklists that you can go through in the Bible to say, hey, am I ready for Jesus Christ to come? Am I even looking? Right? Some brethren have taken their eyes off Jesus Christ and they put it on the world. Now, I understand, Brother Jesus Christ, what's going on in the world. I do. I see a lot of things going on in the world. Right now, a lot of countries are going bankrupt. The financial system of the world, uh, all these countries, the, that are almost every country is in debt. Every country around the world is in serious debt. And now it's time that debt's coming due. And a lot of countries are collapsing uh, financially, economically. Uh, there's a worldwide famine that's being orchestrated. Okay, uh, the Bible said, and we're, I'm getting ahead of myself when we get into the watch, there's eight commands that God gives a soldier. So our first today's checklist is about how to be a good soldier for Jesus Christ. You're given eight commands. Okay, and we're going to go through those eight commands. People usually think there's only six. There's actually eight commands. Okay, what you're supposed to do as a soldier. Okay. Um, but I see that going on. It's orchestrated. Yes, the Bible talks about in these last days before Jesus comes back, there's going to be famines, plural. But this is a worldwide orchestrated famine that I believe has to do with bringing in the mark of the beast. Okay? You can't buy or sell without the mark. You want food? Okay, there's got to be a, you know, there might be, I don't know, I can't explain 100% what's going to happen in the time of Jacob's trouble. I won't be here for it. But there's got to be some kind of demand where they're trying to get people to accept the mark and worship the beast. And one of those things I believe when you read the scriptures and do the study into it, it's food and clothing. Never says, with food and raiment, therewith be content. We can do that today, but in the time of Jacob's trouble, in order to have food and raiment, you got to take, for predominantly, you have to take the mark and worship the beast. Okay? You're going to have to learn to live without. I see what's going on in the world. Feminism is out of control in the world. So, uh, sexual perversion, the Bible calls it sodomy. All sexual perversion can be summed up into one word. It's called sodomy. And the lost world tries to get away from that word sodomy because they try to get away from this book. Okay. Uh, false gods are going on left and right. you got abortion. They're killing the babies. Uh, this Roe versus Wade that came out. I did an abortion study for a, a request from a brother in Christ. I did an abortion study. Uh, be careful, um, not to, brethren that are in ministry, be careful not to get so lazy that you can't turn it into a Bible study. Oh, it's just common sense. Everybody should know that. Turn it into a Bible study. This is our final authority, not this. Okay, talk, 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 talk. It's not this. This is our final authority. When we talk, the word that we're hiding in our heart is supposed to come out. God's word is supposed to come out. Some brethren, are, they're starting to become a talk show. And they're forgetting that Turn it into a Bible study. It's not hard. It just takes time. It's, and we're going to get into that. Okay? But I see what's going on in the world, Brother Jesus Christ, because I don't talk about it that much. It's not because um, I'm not seeing it. I don't talk about it much because you've got all these other brethren that are getting distracted. And we're going to talk about this. They're getting distracted by the world so much. That that's all they want to talk about is what's going on in the world. They don't want to talk about what's going on in the heart of a Christian. A Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman and how you're supposed to live your life. They don't want to talk about that blessed hope and keeping your eyes on Jesus Christ. You can come back any day now. Okay. The Bible does say watch. I'm getting ahead of myself. It says watch and strengthen the things that remain. When we look to see what's going on out in the world, it's supposed to motivate us to look for that blessed hope. Jesus is coming back. It can happen any day now. Look how bad it's getting out there. It can happen any day now. I need to get back to my walk with the Lord. Is there anything I need to get done? 
And that's why we're going to go through this checklist. There's things that I need to do. Okay. When you start watching the world too much, two things happen. One, you get distracted. While you're busy looking at the world, your eyes aren't here. Your eyes aren't on Jesus Christ and His coming. Your eyes are too busy distracted by, ooh, what's going on in the world? What's going on in the world? What's going on in the world? We're not to watch the world so we can be distracted by it. We're to watch the world so we can strengthen the things that remain. We look and see what's going on out there. Then we, look, we go immediately back to here to say, oh, the Bible said that's going to happen. The Lord could come back any day now. Then you look here. If I had a mirror, I'd say, if I point at mirror. Then you look in that mirror and say, okay, Lord, what do I need to do? Is there anything I still need to do that I need to get out of my life? Is there things I'm not doing that I'm supposed to be doing? We're going to get into that in, that, in this checklist. Uh, so they, the lost world, the world, when you look at the world long enough, it can distract you. The second thing the world can do when you look at it long enough is it can start changing you. Oh yeah. I always tell this. I'm driving on the beach. We have this highway that goes right along the coast and it's cliff side. This is Oregon. The most beautiful beaches in America. Oregon. All right. These beaches are amazing, and you're driving along the highway that's on the cliff side, and you look down, and you can see beaches, you can see the ocean, and as you're driving, especially when the sun's coming down, there's times where I'm driving on the road, and I look over to look at the sunset, the ocean, the beaches, the rocks, the mountains, and it's just so beautiful. And I'm looking at it, and sometimes if I'm looking at it too long, guess what happens, brother says Christ? I start turning the direction I'm looking. And I'm like, oh, oh, and I got to pull... Have you seen people do that? You're like, you think they're drunk? Probably, someone probably thought I was drunk or something. No, I was looking at something for too long. You glance over and say, that's beautiful, and then you get your eyes back on the road. You glance at what's going on in the world, and then you get your eyes back on Jesus Christ and His Word. You don't stay looking. What happens if you look at the world for too long? I'm sorry, look at the world. Not the, yeah. Look at the world for too long. You start going the way of the world. It starts changing you. And there's brethren I've seen that get so distracted by what's going on in the world, it's changing them. They're starting to become worldly. They start to give it in to fear. And they'll quote that scripture. The Bible says, we're not given a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. But they actually have fear. They've got worldliness. Their priorities all get all messed up. Because they're going the way of the world, because they're being distracted by the world, and they're keeping their eyes on the world too much. Brothers and sisters Christ, I said before, I spend probably 20 to 30 minutes total in a day. Maybe 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the afternoon. I look, I have some websites that I look at for the news and everything, and I look out there and say, Lord, it is getting bad out there. Oh, Lord, it is getting so bad out there. What are we going to get done today? Oh, that's right, I'm in 1 Samuel today, so we can listen to some of the Bible today. I need to read the Bible. I need to uh, get work done around this house. I need to witness for Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about these here in a bit. Uh, okay. Witness for Jesus Christ. If it's, t if it's a day to go into town, lay gospel tracts out. Okay. But I go back to looking at the Lord and saying, Lord, what are we doing today? What do I need to get done for? You glance at the world and you look back at Jesus Christ. You don't get so, if you just get so fixated on what's going on out, and you take your eyes off Jesus Christ and you get to looking at the world for too long, it's going to distract you. It's going to, um, it's going to start changing you. A good example of this is, okay, I had a brother in Christ, okay, he used to teach he used to believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. He taught it went hand in hand with the catching way, believing in the catching way of the body of Christ, uh, being caught up. The pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching way of the body of Christ. They go hand in hand. When people turn their back on the imminent return of Jesus Christ, he taught, that means they're on the verge of going post and mid-trip. Now the Bible doesn't say believing in that best blessed hope, and we'll get into those verses. It does not say believing in those but in that blessed hope. What does it say, brothers? How many of you remember those scriptures? What does it say, brothers and sisters of Christ? Does it say believing? Pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catch away the body of Christ. Or does it say looking for that blessed hope? The imminent return of Jesus Christ. He could come back any day now. I'm looking for it in the life that I'm living. Lord, what do I need to get done today? 
You could come back today. What do I need to get done for you today? Oh, we're still here the next day? Okay, you could come back the next day. What do I need to get done to you that day? And so on and so forth. And you have your walk, your day-to-day -day walk with the Lord, and you have the attitude in your heart and the life that you're living, you're looking for that blessed hope. You've got, I know a brother that used to believe that. And you know what he did? He looked at what's going on in the world behind there's a window. <laughs> so I'm pointing out there. He looked at what's going out in the world, and you can see this. This is the world. This is the new man that's in Christ Jesus. He's out, he looks out in the world, lightning and everything. He looks out in the world, and he saw how bad it was out there. And you know what he came back to the brethren with? He came back to the brethren with, are you ready? Jesus could come back any day now. Look how bad it's getting out there. It could, he'd come back any day now. Are you ready? Is there still some sanctification that needs to go on? Are you, still, are you staying in your Bibles and reading your Bibles every day? You starting your day with the Lord, ending your day with the Lord. He'd go through the whole list and start talking to you and say, Are you ready for the, the catching away of the body of Christ? The pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away of the body of Christ. Are you ready for that blessed hope? That's how he used to come, come back. Then he started gaining things, worldly things. Okay, Wife, children, properties, whatever. And this happens to a lot of men. Okay, I've seen it happen to a lot of men. When they are single and in ministry, they don't have much to lose. They start gaining things after being in ministry for years and years. Then they start gaining things to lose. Then they start getting fearful. And this brother in Christ, he's still a brother in Christ, and I still love him, and I still pray for him every day. He used to say, are you ready for the catching away of the body of Christ? Now, guess what? He turned his back on the imminent return of Jesus Christ for the world. His eyes are no longer looking for that blessed hope. His eyes are no longer on Jesus Christ. It's on the world. So now when bad things happen, the lightning, the storm, you know, everything I just mentioned, all this bad stuff that's going out there, when he sees the bad things that goes on in the world, he doesn't come back with, are you ready to go home? Are you ready for Jesus to come? He doesn't have that attitude. What does he have? Are you ready for two billion people to die? Are you ready to hunker down? Are you ready for a worldwide famine? Are you ready to, you know, flee the cities? Learn to live in the wilderness? Are you ready to endure to the end, to be caught up? He doesn't say that, but that's the way he's acting. What happened to the, the man that would motivate you to keep your eyes on Jesus Christ and living for Jesus Christ every day? That man's gone. Why? Because he turned his back on the imminent return of Jesus Christ. You get to looking at the world long enough, you get to start getting comfortable down here. I'm listening to a Bible study right now that Peter Ruckman did about the homeless Christian. This isn't our home. We're not supposed to be comfortable down here. Okay, we're, we're ambassadors for Jesus Christ. An ambassador is someone who leaves their home and goes into a foreign nation. He's an ambassador. We're in a foreign nation. But you start collecting things down here, and you start getting things that you're just like, I don't know if I can lose that. I don't know if I can lose my wife for the sisters in Christ. I don't know if I can lose my husband. I don't know if I can lose my kids. I don't know if I can lose my way of life. And you start getting really comfortable down here. And the, and the world's telling you this stuff is more important than the Lord and His Word. And you start going with it. Okay. Are you ready to be caught up in death or life? There's an old hymn, it's when Jesus comes. One sat alone beside the highway begging. His eyes were blind, the light he did not see. He clutched his rags and shivered in the shadows. Then Jesus came and bade his darkness flee. When Jesus comes, the tempter's power is broken. When Jesus comes, the tears are wiped away. He takes the gloom and fills this life with glory. For all is changed when Jesus comes to stay. So men today have found the Savior able. They could not conquer passion, lust, and sin. Their broken hearts had left them sad and lonely. Then Jesus came and dwelt himself within. When Jesus comes, the tempter's power is broken. When Jesus comes, 
the tears are wiped away. He takes the gloom and fills this life with glory. For all is changed when Jesus comes to stay. Brothers and sisters of Christ, it starts here. First time Jesus comes to stay with you, brothers and sisters of Christ, it's here. He sends the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. Second time Jesus comes, he's coming in the clouds to call us home. If he doesn't touch down, he comes in the clouds and calls us home. When Jesus comes, will you be ready? And the reason we're going to be going through these checklists is here's the question I've asked brethren in the past, and some of the brethren have forgotten this. Okay? Are you ready to be caught up in life or in death? And what do I mean by that is if I don't get to live to see the catching away of the body of Christ, I'm going to be caught up in death. My soul is going to be caught up. And I'll be up there waiting for the catching away of the body of Christ. Remember the Bible says the dead in Christ rise first. Those are all the brethren that have died before the catching away of the body of Christ. From the death of Jesus Christ uh, to the catching away of the body of Christ. And when he was resurrected, the Old Testament saints were resurrected. But after his resurrection, that's the first part of the resurrection, from that part to the catching away of the body of Christ, if you die in that time, you will be resurrected at the catching away of the body of Christ. The dead in Christ rise first. So that's what I mean by if you get caught up in death, your soul goes up. And you stand before Jesus Christ. If you get to live to see the catching away of the body of Christ, actually be alive when it happens, you're going to be caught up, and guess who you're going to be standing before? Jesus Christ. God has given all a judgment and authority unto Jesus Christ, His body. God the Father through Jesus Christ. Okay. Either way, the question I've always asked the brethren is, is, what will Jesus say when He sees you? Judgment seat of Christ, He calls your name. Philip Newton, start with me. Philip Newton, come up hither. Okay. Philip Newton, come on up. I go up and stand before Him. All my works get thrown on. My good... My good works and my bad works, okay, they get thrown on the fire and they get burnt. When Jesus looks at me, is he going to look at me and go, Well done, thou good and faithful one. Well done, thou good and faithful one. Or will he just shake my head, look at me and go, not shake my head, but he looks at me and shakes his head and goes, picks the penny off the fire and says, Here's your penny. Move along. Next. I'm telling you right now, in my walk with the Lord, there's been points in my life where I was almost positive that I'd been the, the latter situation. If he had called us home then, I'd have been the latter situation. Here's your penny. Okay. There's times in my life where I feel like, not feel like, there's times in your life, brother, sister Christ, where you realize you've fallen. You start giving into temptation. You start giving into sin. You start giving into the distraction of the world. You start becoming worldly. You start coveting things. Now I can go through the whole list. You start having pride in your life, envy in your life, bitterness in your life. You just started setting a bad example for the Lord. And you're like, Lord, I don't want you to come in. I got so much to clean up. I don't. I'm, I, please don't come back right now. I got to get this. How many have had that attitude? Where you realize how far you've fallen and it's time to get to cleaning. Your house is falling apart and it's dirty. You need to clean the house up and you need to fix the house up. You need to get to work for the Lord ASAP. As soon as possible. ASAP. As soon as possible. He can come back any day now. When he comes back and he takes you home, Brother Jesus Christ, what's he going to say? What's he going to say? I know there's some prideful, <laughs> ego-driven brother now. He's going to say, I was amazing. I pray that he says I did good. And I'm struggling every day to continue to fight for the Lord and to live for the Lord in my life and to do the work that the Lord has asked me to do. Okay, There are days where I feel like he's going to say, well done, good and faithful one. And then every once in a while, I trip and fall. And I look up and I'm like, if he found, came back when I'm falling flat on my face, he's going to be, is he going to say, here's your penny? Like he's, he's just... He's ashamed of me. Here's your penny. Move along. Okay. Brothers and sisters Christ, this is going to be a ch one of the checklists we're going to go through to help you with your walk today to see how you line up when you get called home. Is he going to say, well done, a good faithful one? Okay. Turn to 2 Timothy 2.19. 2 
in your King James Bible's authorized version. Okay. 2 Timothy 2.19 reads, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His. The Lord knoweth them that are His. Remember what the Bible says? The seal that it's talking about is when you are truly saved and born again. And we're going to go through the whole plan of salvation. But when God saves you, He looks at the heart, not the head. You can believe in the catching away of the body of Christ, but are you living it? Then that belief is in vain. If you're not looking for Jesus Christ as coming back with the life that you live, your heart is something where you live. It's how you live your life is based off your heart. If you're hiding God's Word in your heart, that's what you're going to live. If you're just hiding God's Word in your head, but you're hiding iniquity in your heart, remember what Pete, uh, King David said in the Psalms, if I hold iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. The number one reason God won't hear prayers is because of iniquity. You're hiding here. Not throwing it at the foot of the cross. You're holding it here. When you hold iniquity in your heart, that's how you're living. When you hold the Word of God in your heart, that's how you're living. Remember, I hate to, I'm trying not to go off on a tangent too much because there's a lot in this study. But it's a heart matter, not a head matter. Okay, God looks at the heart. But when God saves you, the Bible says you are sealed unto the day of redemption. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. That's what this seal is talking about. God stands sure having this seal. He makes a promise. He keeps it. This is God Almighty that we're talking about. The Lord knoweth them that are His. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Any iniquities being that you're holding your heart? There's a difference real quick. If I trip and fall and God gets me back up, I'm not holding iniquity in my heart. I gave in to iniquity. What it means by holding iniquity in my heart, when King David was talking about, is when you justify sin. You justify worldliness. You justify covetousness, which is idolatry. Okay. You justify the world's way over doing things God's way. You're holding sin in your heart, saying, I don't want to let it go. It's mine. That's what's talking about where God won't hear your prayer. If you sin, God will still hear your prayer. I struggle, I fall, and I sin. But when you take that sin and you hold it in your heart, and when a brethren comes to you to correct you, you kick him to the curb like he's nothing. I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care what the brethren says. I don't care what anyone says. You're holding that iniquity in your heart, and you won't let go. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. The moment you fell, fall, uh, fall and fail the Lord, God gets you back up, brother of Christ. Repent, forsake, get back to your walk with the Lord. Okay. But this is Paul saying, once again, sin's a big deal. Just because you're saved, are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we the dead to sin living any longer therein? Paul's always preaching against sin, even for, mainly to the saved sinners, more than the lost. If you actually look at 1 and 2 Corinthians, he's preaching against sin more to saved sinners, saying, hey, you're supposed to be saved now. The Holy Spirit comes in and starts cleaning up your life. Put away that sin. Get away from that iniquity. Depart from iniquity. Okay. But, he uses the word but. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from sin. Remember when we say with the word but, it kind of negates the first part. But, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earth. Gold and silver, well done, thou good and faithful one. Well done, thou good and faithful one. But also of wood and earth. Here's your penny. Next. Some to honor. Well done, thou good and faithful one. And some to dishonor. Give me back that penny. Go, get out of here. Now, the Lord ain't going to take back the penny, but here's your penny. Move. Next. Which one are you, brothers and sisters of Christ? In these last days, are you getting so distracted by what's going on out there that you're becoming the wood and earth and to dishonor? I know a brother in Christ that he can't tell the difference between friend and foe anymore. Anybody that's against him, against what he believes, and tells him he's wrong, you're an enemy. Can't tell friend from foe anymore. 
that usually comes from bitterness. That comes from bad experiences where a brethren have stabbed you in the back and, it, and you just get this shield where you have a hard time trusting people. I understand that. But when everybody that, ter- that tells you you're wrong is an enemy? Wow. Dishonor. Now, what's this great house that's being talked about here? 1 Timothy 3.15. You go back a few pages. 1 Timothy 3.15. It says, but if I tarry long that thou mayest know that thou, how thou ought to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Your body is a temple for the Holy Ghost. And together we come together and form the house of God. So when it's talking about the house of God there, it's talking about saved sinners. So once again, I'll ask whether it's just Christ when you get called home, whether in death or life, what's Jesus going to say? When you walk up there for the judgment, uh, the judgment seat, I'll probably have my face flat on the ground and be grateful for a penny. There's days I feel like that. There is. And I, I believe that we all feel like that sometimes. Okay, we have our off days. We have bad days. But we also have good days if you're staying focused on the Word and you keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Okay. Every time you look at the world and the direction it's going in, it's time to hit the checklist. When you look at the world, if you're one of those people that love news, 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 and you're going to make a ministry based off the news, anytime you look at the news, you need to be coming back to the brethren and saying, okay, it's time to hit the checklist. If all you're doing is saying, look what's going on, look what's going on, look what's going on, then you're not really helping the body of Christ. When you say, look what's going on, it's time to hit the checklist. Are you ready for Jesus Christ to come back? Anybody that has a ministry that's based off looking at the world and news, it should be to encourage the brethren to keep their eyes on Jesus Christ and living for Him every day, because we could get caught up any day now. Any day now. Okay? Especially what I see going out there. It motivates me more and more to live for the Lord and to get more sin out of, life. And if I, out of my life. And if I've let sin back into my life, because that happens sometimes, to get it right back out. Keep fighting, brother and sister Christ. Fight the good fight. Okay. We'll hit the checklist. So the first checklist we're going to be going through, turn to 2 Timothy 2.1. For this study, and it's going to be a big one, but 2 Timothy 2.1. Okay. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is what? In Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who are able to teach others also. We're to set the example. We're supposed to be a light into the world. And men, elder men, are supposed to be teaching the younger men. Elder women are supposed to be teaching the younger women good things, but elder men are supposed to be teaching the young men the Word of God. And then those young men grow up and become elderly men, and they teach the next generation. And so on, and so on. We're not supposed to be a one-man show, brothers and Christ. Just want to throw that out there. You need to teach others. You don't just teach everyone. You need to teach others how to teach. Teach others how to be in ministry. That's why we're supposed to do that. Not all people are called into ministry, but every man, I believe, should be ready for the call. You might never get called into ministry. Part time. We call part time ministry is ministry. The Bible doesn't talk about full time. It just shows uh, Paul as an example of full time ministry. Okay, there's, very, there's a lot of brethren out there claiming they're full-time ministry, but when you, hold, when you line them up to Paul, they're not full-time ministry. I'm not full-time. There was a time where I called myself full-time ministry, and then God corrected me and said, eh, you're really not full-time ministry, but ministry is ministry. God's going to call you in the ministry of reconciliation. He calls us all into the ministry of reconciliation. But maybe he'll call you into doing more than that. Okay, You should always be ready to. Okay, the Bible talks about being ready to give an answer. Verse 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. In this world, when you live for the Lord, and you take His word, and you hide it in your heart, and you're looking for that blessed hope with the life that you're living, you're going to have to endure hardness. You're going to have sacrifices. Okay? This says, Thou thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. 
We look for Jesus Christ. We live for Jesus Christ. Hide God's word in our heart. That's our fight. We fight against wickedness and sin. Remember the Bible says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And there's nothing wrong with watching the world, but we get back to the fight. Okay. This right here just said, we're not to entangle ourselves with the affairs of this life. I see a lot of brethren out there starting to entangle themselves with the affairs of this life. Oh, we can fight this. Oh, we can fight that. And, and we can change the world. And, and we can have revival. And we can do that. That's getting entangled with the affairs of this life. We're supposed to stay focused here. And make sure this is here. And we're living it. And we got our eyes on Jesus Christ. Could he come back today? Could he come back right when I'm doing this study? Yes, he could. Now, God's got the timing all set up. And he's got time purpose perfectly, but we're to live as if he could come back any day now. That's what the Bible teaches. Anybody that teaches otherwise, they've lost that blessed hope. They've lost faith in that hope. Eh, it's not going to happen for five or six years. That's someone who's lost faith in this book and that blessed hope. Be very careful that you don't lose faith. Okay? I'm getting ahead of myself, but the Bible talks about let no man steal thy crown. One of the crowns you get is because you're looking, present tense, with the life that you're living for that blessed hope. And you've got men that are trying to get you to take your eyes off of that hope and put it on the world. They're trying to steal your crown. Be careful with that. So the checklist we're going to go through is the soldier. Being a good soldier, one of the things it says here is not to be entangled with the affairs of this life. Okay? This body of flesh is going to tempt you to pull you away. You've got lost world that's going to try to tempt you and pull, and pull you away, just lost people in general. You're going to have brethren that fall away. And we're going to get into that at the very end of this study when it talks about watching. You have brethren that fall away that's going to try to pull you away. But more than anything, what says not to get entangled with the affairs of this life is the world. The direction that the world is going in is that it's always going to be contrary to the Bible. Okay, always contrary to the Bible. I had a great man of God say that Whatever's popular in the world, religious, religion-wise, it's mostly acceptable and popular in the world, we're not to have any part of that. Because the world's way is always going to be contrary to this book. Who's the lowercase g God of this world? Satan. The Bible says that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Things in this world that's highly, every, the world as a whole loves it, it's acceptable, and it's good, and it's true, it's an abomination in God's sight. Like I said, I looked out there, the feminism. Uh, uh, rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. What is feminism? Women rebelling against God. They don't want to stay in the boundary that God set. They want to be in the men's boundary. Okay, and there are some men that try to be in the women's boundary. That's where you get sodomy. So you got feminism, you got sodomy, and these are widely accepted among the world. Uh, it's an abomination inside of God. These are obvious things. But one thing I'll just sneak in there is a little poke. What about holidays? Are they widely accepted among the world as something great and good and everyone should be keeping them. Oh boy. Just a little poke there. We're not going to get into that though. Uh, Ephesians 6.10. Turn to Ephesians 6.10. So being a good soldier, the first thing we're told is not to get entangled with the affairs of this life. Be very careful that when you're looking that you don't start driving over, to, <laughs> like I said, start driving over and, and running into what you're looking at. We glance at the world. Okay, that's going on. Was, then we go right back to looking here. What does the Bible say about it? How we, Lord, what am I supposed to do today? What do I need to get done for you today? You don't let the world change you, and you don't get distracted by what's going on in the world. You continue to live a life of Christ and fighting for the gospel, and you fight for the Lord. Okay. Ephesians 6.10 So here, when we hit Ephesians 6.10, is where we're going to get eight commands for a soldier. And we're going to try to go through them kind of quick because we've went, we're making individual um, videos for each piece of the armor of God. Because the commands are, is there six pieces of armor that you're supposed to put on and then two things you do after you put on that armor. Okay. So let's look at this. Ephesians 6.10.
Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. How do you be strong in the Lord and the power of His might? By verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Once again, we're not supposed to be out there trying to change the world. We can't. God's, I believe, a little side note, I believe what's going on out there, God's orchestrating things. He's bringing everything together for the time of Jacob's trouble. Satan thinks he's doing it. Oh, I'm the one doing it. But remember, the Old Testament, Job, Satan had to go stand before God and give an account of himself to God. He had to get permission before he could do anything down here to Job. Satan doesn't have all this power and authority. Yes, he's the lowercase g God of this world, but it was only given to him by God because of the fall of Adam. Right? He still has to stand before God and give an account of himself, and he still has to get permission from God. Satan wants to take all the authority that everything that's going out there, oh, it's Satan. No, God's like, you want the wickedness? You want the evil? He's letting it happen. He's letting everything come together for the time of Jacob's trouble where he's going to be pouring out his wrath. We can't change that. But what we can do is today we can fight against darkness by being a light to the world. Jesus always used that as an example. We're supposed to be a light to the world. Right? He is the light of the world. And He is supposed to be in us, and we're supposed to let Jesus shine through us by hiding His Word in our heart and living it. And saying, I'm not going to have anything to do with that. The world's going that way, but I'm not going that way. Okay? Someone said that the most uh, powerful word in the, in the world in history is, is no. Uh, the, most the Bible says where the word of the king is, there is power. The most powerful words are the words of the king. In history, the most powerful word has always been yes when it comes to Jesus Christ, King of Kings, and saying no to Satan in the world. Yes to Jesus Christ, no to Satan in the world. Mm -hmm. But we, we, we wrestle not again. I'll say it again, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We pray against sin. We pray for people to get saved. We pray for people to get their lives cleaned up. We point them to the Word of God. We point them to Jesus Christ as the solution to all their problems. But we don't get entangled with the affairs of this life. Okay? You want to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the worldliness in the world? You make sure you're putting on that whole armor of God. And that's what we're going to be going through. Verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. The whole armor. If you're missing all so much as one piece, brother and sister Christ, that's all it takes an arrow to get through to hurt you. The world. The wiles of the devil. If you're not putting on the whole, that's why it says take on you the whole armor of God. People say, well, I just love that shield of faith. Faith, 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 faith. It does say that above all, taking that shield of faith. Absolutely. It's so important to have that shield. But you need to have the sword too. You need to have the helmet. You need to have the breastplate. You need to have the shoes. You need to be girding up your loins with the sword. Right? You need it all. Okay. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And we talked about before, is Jesus going to come back and find you falling flat on your face? Your armor's in the corner there gathering dust? Or is he going to find you having the whole armor of God on, trying to do your best to stand? You might still trip and fall sometimes, and God picks you back up. Trip and fall sometimes, and God picks you back up. But you have the whole armor of God on, and you're doing your best to stand. How's he going to find you? 14. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye or shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Some of the brethren are failing because they put down that shield of faith. They don't believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ anymore. They don't believe in present tense looking for that blessed hope. No, that's not going to happen for five years. What they do? They put down their shield of faith. And worldliness starts come, comes rushing in. All these darts come flying in from everywhere. They don't have a shield anymore. Okay. The fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet for our hope of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And that's where a lot of people stop. They say, okay, the sword, okay, that's the sixth thing that we're commanded. Okay, we're done, right? 
How about we keep reading? Verse 18. Praying always. That's the seventh command. When you put on the whole armor of God, you start praying always with all prayer and supplication in the capital S spirit. And watching thereunto, and the second and the eighth thing is, is and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. You know how we watch the, what's going on in the world? So we can warn the brethren. Keep living for Jesus Christ. We can encourage one another. Keep living for Jesus Christ. I'm getting ahead of myself because we will get to that point. But we watch thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me the utterance may be given unto me that I may, op may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Remember, the mystery of the gospel is revealed to Paul. Okay? Now we see there that there's eight things there. And notice it says, in the Spirit, when it comes to uh, praying always with prayer and supplication in the capital S Spirit. Remember Romans chapter 8, it says, whether you're walking, you can walk after the Spirit. You're capital S spiritually minded and you're walking after the Spirit. Or you're carn carnally minded, the flesh is in charge, and you're walking after the, the flesh. Okay? When you start holding sin here, you're not walking after the Spirit. What are you walking after? The flesh. That's why God doesn't hear your prayers. That's why it says, in the Spirit. Are you walking in the Spirit? Are you not holding, you might, like I said, you might be walking, you might trip, and then God gets you back up and helps you back up, and you go back along, you go good ways, and then, whoa, then God gets you back up, and then you keep going. That's not holding sin in your heart. Iniquity in your heart. Holy iniquity in your heart is where you trip, fall down, and say, you know what? It's, it's kind of comfortable down here. I'm just going to lay down here. This is good. And when God tries to pick you up, don't touch me, God. I like laying down here. A brother comes by and tries to pick you up, get away. I don't care what anybody else says. I love, what I, the, I love this state that I'm in right now. That's holding iniquity in your heart. There's a difference. Please, please understand that, Brother Christ, there's a difference. I'm not hitting you saying, if you sin, God won't hear you. Yes, He will. It's when you hold that sin in your heart and you won't let it go that God will not hear your prayers. Remember that. So there's eight actions as a soldier for Jesus Christ to do. Now, you don't have to turn to all these at this point. You can pause the video and turn to these. But we're going to hit a lot of little scriptures here and there. And we're just going to briefly go over each one. And I've got some Bible study videos on each one that's in more detail. We haven't gone through the whole, all of all these eight commands yet. Uh, things come out and God says, hey, do this study instead. And I put it on hold. Uh, but we have done some studies. And we will get through the whole armor of God eventually. Okay, so we're going to hit a lot of verses. Uh, pause the video and you can turn to them. But the first command is to, the loins girt about with truth. And we've done a video, I have a Bible study on this, loins girt about with truth. Okay? It's not a belt. People always try to make it look, they always try to make the armor, let's see if I can find it right here. I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> such a small coin. It's such a small coin. But even this Christian coin that goes through and has the Ephesians 6, 10 through 12, and it's the whole armor of God, and it's the King James Bible version, but when you go and look at the man holding the armor, they always make it look like a Roman soldier. Okay? And they give him a belt. Okay? We did this study, and we talked about how when it says girding up your loins is an action. And yes, I understand when you put the belt on, it's an action too, but when you actually look at the Jews back in the day, uh, they had the robes that goes down, and the skirt of the robe was the bottom part, and what they'd do is they'd have to gird up their loins to go to work. So they can work in the fields. So when you gird up your loins, you did it for two reasons. To work, and they'd have to gird up their loins so they could attach the, the scabbard that holds the sword, had hooks that, went, that folded around when they girded up their loins. It folded around the clothing there so that their sword could be on them, and they would gird up their loins to go to war. So you'd go, gird up your loins to fight, and you'd gird up your loins to work. So when it says, learn, loins girt about with truth, what's truth? The Word of God. Okay? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy Word is truth. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But you're girding up your loins as an action. It means you, you're taking that sword and you're getting ready to use it to do some work for the Lord. Or you're getting ready to fight for the Lord. 
That's what's going on here, okay? 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay? This book here, when you're girding up your loins with truth, if you're going to do the work of the Lord, and you're going to fight for the Lord, work for the Lord, in other words, the life that you live for Jesus Christ, and fight for the Lord, you need to study this Bible. Okay? And you rightly divide. There's divisions in the Bible. It's called dispensations. There's people that attack that, okay? How often are you studying this book, let alone reading it? How often are you studying it? Remember, there's three ways to study the Bible. We'll get to it in just a second. Psalms 119.11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. When you take this book and hide it in your heart and start living it, it keeps you away from sin. It does. It's, it's done for me. Okay, I'm living proof, I'm a living testimony that when you take God's word and hide it in your heart and you start living it, most of the sin gets out of your life. And when you have been saved long enough, you'll realize that most of your fighting with temptation and sin is here. Okay, thinking it is it's just as bad as doing it. The Bible says taking pleasure in those that do them. Okay, when you start taking when it starts coming in up here, it's almost as bad as doing it, if not equal. But most of your fighting is going to be up here and not physically falling into sin and tempt, fall into temptation and choosing to sin, although it does happen sometimes. But you realize a lot of your fights up here. I'm sitting there thinking of a Bible study. I was getting frustrated and God had to put me in my place again. But I was getting frustrated and it started coming out towards God last night. I was sitting on the deck praying and God had to put me back in my place again. But um, I was like, how does that happen, Lord? I'm just so frustrated with this wicked flesh. I'm sitting there thinking of King David because I'm going through 1 Samuel right now and I'm talking about the story of King David. And one of the stories of King David made me think of something about the world. And the next thing you know, it goes into this, it goes into that, it goes that. And the next thing I know, I'm spending three minutes thinking about some Hollywood movies and TV shows. I'm like, how did I get here, Lord? How did I get here? Oh, Lord, have mercy on me. And I was getting mad at my flesh, but, but, but this, it's almost like I was taken out of the Lord and the Lord had put me in my place. But I was mad at my flesh because that's the fight that we struggle with. But the more you hide this in your heart, the quicker it is to get back to doing what's right. It took a few minutes and God's like, how did I get here, Lord? I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have been thinking of this. Get it out of my head, Lord. What were we talking about? And sometimes I have to backtrack. What were we talking Oh, that's what we were talking about. And then you get back to talk to the Lord about King David. And, and Saul and what's going on and Samuel, okay? you got to do that sometimes. But it's, it gets more possible that this hides in your heart. If you're not hiding this in your heart, you know what would have happened to me? I would start thinking of those Hollywood movies and everything, and the next thing you know, I'd gotten tempted that I would have come inside, and it went, it went from me thinking about it to me actually watching it and participating in it. This book is what saves me so much from actually participating in it and helping me get it out of my head quick when it comes in. Okay. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalms 119.9 says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Okay. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. John 17.17. 17. Okay. We are commanded to study the word of God. Lawrence girded about with truth. And how do you study it? There's three ways that I always teach. Because I was taught this by my mentor, and I'm passing this teaching on to other men so that you and women, that you can do some studies for yourself. Okay, there's word studies. And what word studies is, is you go through every time the word's mentioned, and you get the context to find the definition. That's what word studies are for, is to get the context of the word. Because words have different definitions sometimes. Some of the false teachings out there is they'll take words in the Bible and make it all universal. It all means the same thing everywhere. No, it does not. Okay? okay. Uh, so you do word studies. Okay, you can do subject studies. Okay, I'm going to do a study on animals. What were animals like in all the different dispensations? And we did this recently. God put it on my heart to do a subject study. And we went through and looked at all the animals in the different dispensations. And we wanted to know what makes them different and what's it going to be like in that day. Okay? You can do subject studies, eternal security. You can do subject studies, Godhead. Subject studies on the time of Jacob's trouble. You can do subject studies on the pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ. Okay? You can do subject study on dispensations, but the fact that the Bible has div 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 divisions. Okay? You can do subject studies. And the third one is an expository study. Okay, expository studies, i got to throw this in there again, is not lazy studies, brothers and sisters of Christ. 
What's lazy is when you have someone start expository studies and quit them. That's lazy, okay? But expository studies are basically a subject study and word study together because you're going verse by verse and you're hitting every word to try to pick up all the main words that God put on your heart to do a study on as you're doing an expository study and you're grabbing every subject and hitting on every subject as best you can as you're doing an expository study. Expository studies take the most work out of all three of these studies. Word studies and subject studies are both involved when you're doing an expository study. Expository study says right here, let's say Ephesians 6, you start with uh, verse 1, you say, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Then you go around the Bible showing subjects where children are disobeying the Lord, where children are obeying the Lord. Okay? What, you know, you're comparing Scripture with Scripture, it's a subject study, okay? Uh, and then two, honor thy father and mother. Well, what does the word honor mean? Well, now you start looking into word studies on what does the word honor mean? Okay, and then you look at other places, subject studies, where it talks about you have to honor your mother and father, where people fail to honor their mother and father. Okay, that's the whole point. It's, it's a more deeper study, okay? And I've always talked to people that I like to get these right here. Okay, this is Strong's Concordance. The front half, is it the front half? Or it's the back half? You just want the concordance, you don't want the Hebrew. Here's the Hebrew and everything. Don't want the Hebrew. Or the Greek. Here we go. It's the front half. The front half, A all the way through Z. It's the front half. But you just want the concordance so when you look up a word, it'll tell you where it's at in the Bible. That's what this is. Just the first half, you just want the concordance for the King James Bible, the strongest concordance. You don't, okay, you can have computer programs, but the reason I have this is what happens when we lose internet? What happens when we lose electricity? Does that mean all your studying comes to a stop? It's always good to have the physical, okay? And this is 100% detailed when it comes to uh, the court uh, telling you where everything is. You have a miniaturized version of this sometimes in your Bibles that you have. You'll have a concordance in the Bible, but it doesn't go over every word that's in the Bible. This has every word that's in the King James Bible and where to find it. That's why it's so, that's why it's so thick and such a big book. Okay. Second thing that I suggest when you're doing your word studies, subject studies, expository studies, is to get a Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Okay, and I've already did a little video on how to do a word study, and I had some people attack me because they don't like it. It's like, it takes work. It's going to take time. Stop cry crying. Stop whining. It's going to take time to do a Bible study. When you do a word study, you write down, I'd say, start with this as a template. Remember, this isn't always right. I've proven where this is wrong. Uh, or not wrong, but I've proven where the, the definitions here, not all the definitions here, are here. Okay, and this has worldly definitions that aren't here. Okay? But what you do is you find the words you're going to do, and you write down the definitions that are here. And then as you do your word study, when you find new definitions, you add them to the list, and you label each definition with a, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, R, 1 through whatever. And every verse you go through, you put the number down that, okay, here's the definition in context. You get the context of the verse and say, okay, this definition lines up with 1. This, def this verse lines up with 4. You know, whatever. You do your own way of doing it, but you get a way where you can link the verses in the Bible to the definitions. Okay, and sometimes you'll have to write in a definition that the Bible has that's not in here. This is not the final authority. This is God's perfect written word. But this has helped me out a lot in studies. It has helped. It's not, okay? So you get these two things, and you do studies for yourself. When you listen to people preach in the Word, a lot today we have a lot of people that just love to listen to preaching, but they don't want to do the studies for themselves. And when you fall in the trap of only wanting to listen to preaching, then sometimes you can be misled by preachers. Okay, wolves in sheep's clothing, but you can even be misled by a preacher that starts going the wrong way. He starts preaching absolute truth, and then over time he starts becoming part of the falling away, and he's going to try. He might start dragging you that direction because all you're doing is I like listening to him, but you don't like having your Bible open. You don't like continuing the study on your own and go a step further than what that preacher taught, trying to see if there was more scriptures that could be used, more examples. Okay. But loins girt about with truth. 
Brother, says Christ, checklist. Are you studying the Word of God and hiding it in your heart and living it? That's a big one. Okay. Two, breastplate of righteousness. Remember what, Jesus, what Paul just said. We read the verse where he said, They that name the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But there says Christ, you are an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Remember what ambassador is. You're in a foreign land. Don't get comfortable down here. This isn't our home. Jesus went to prepare us a home. Remember, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come again and receive you. I probably messed that verse up a little bit. But in my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Our home's up there. It's not down here. When you put on that breastplate of righteousness, like in the military, what we used to have, we used to have our name here uh, on one side, and then you had whatever branch of the military you, you served on the other side. When you put on that breastplate of righteousness, it says Jesus Christ. And you have your name. Born again. Born again, even if it's just your name, or just have born again. Jesus Christ. When you put on that breastplate of righteousness, you are now following Jesus Christ. You're in the Lord's army. You serve Him. He is your Lord. He is your King. He is your Commander-in-Chief. He commands you obey. Jesus said, if a man love me, he will keep my words. What was the first step? Loins girt about with truth. He'll keep them. It's not talking about keeping them like, I have this Bible and it sits there. I'm keeping God's word. It's just sitting there. Keeping it means you're hiding them in your heart and you're living it. Okay? Jesus also said, there's no greater love than this that a man lay down his life for his friend. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I would. Command you. When you got saved, you laid down your life for Jesus Christ at the cross. The old man is dead and buried at the cross. The new man is raised up. And now the new man does whatever Jesus commands him to do. When you put on that breastplate of righteousness, it's because you serve Jesus Christ and he is your commander in chief. First thing he does is he cleans up your life. He starts taking... The, wit, the, the sin and the iniquity that you're, you used to hide in your heart, he takes that sin and iniquity, throws it out, and cleans out like this is your house. He cleans the house out and puts the good things in. He puts this in there. And you start living for Jesus Christ. He starts teaching you things. Stands. He starts showing you his precious promises. The biggest one, that blessed hope. One of the promises that we're sealed until the day of redemption. The next promise is that redemption, the day of redemption, the blessed hope. Okay, 2 Timothy 2.19 says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are His. Are you an ambassador for Jesus Christ? The Bible says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Are you set apart from the world and proving what is good and acceptable will of God, His commands? The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Paul goes on, like I said, he seemed like he was preaching against sin more among uh, saved sinners than lost sinners. Are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And let every one of you that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Yes, brothers and Christ, when you get saved... God's righteousness is, through Jesus Christ is imputed to you. Okay? You are sealed into the day of redemption. You put that breastplate on, you are sealed into the day of redemption. But you're also supposed to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. You're part of, uh, you're part of the ministry of reconciliation. Okay? You're supposed to be setting an example. There's some brethren that aren't setting that good an example. So brothers and Christ, are, do you have that breastplate on? Are you setting a good example for Jesus Christ? Are you living the life of Christ? Are you obeying His commands? You're in an army. I represent Jesus Christ. Okay. Which brings me to the third one. Feet shod with the preparation of peace. The ministry of reconciliation. Remember, we're reconciling the lost world to God. That's why it's called feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Sorry, the gospel of peace. 
Why? Because we're trying to reconcile the lost world to Jesus Christ. Someone came along and reconciled you, brother, sister, Christ, and reconciled me, a lost, hell-bound, dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner, got reconciled to Jesus Christ. Right? Romans 10, 14 says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him on whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet. I think this was done purposely. The feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. And bring glad tidings of good things. When I tell you to keep your eyes on Jesus Christ, that's a good thing. Someone comes along and tells you to take your eyes off Jesus Christ and put it on the world. That's a bad thing. Okay? The gospel of peace. We are sealed into the day of redemption. You can go to heaven someday. I've said this before in some of my studies. Um, I had a fire here before, and I had to evacuate the area, not here in the house, but in the state, and the fire was eight miles away, and the wind picked up, and the wind blew so hard that that fire traveled four miles in one day. And now it was only four miles from the house. So they evacuated the area, and I was one of the ones that evacuated. And I'm sitting there, and I'm talking to people, and I wish I had witnessed more, but that was kind of more when I just moved here, and I was uh, newly saved with, you know, a year or two of being saved. Um, I had a lot of information, but I had no experience about, you know, talking to people about that information. I just kept building this information here. God was still working on my heart, getting iniquity out, and getting some te addictions out still at the time. And... I went down there, and I'm sitting there trying to study the Word of God and everything, and these people, they were all scared to death of losing their homes and losing everything. They were scared. And I'm not mocking their fear, brothers and sisters of Christ. What I'm saying is, is that they looked at me and said, How come you got such peace? Why are you so calm? Why are you so peaceful? I know where I'm going when I die. This isn't my home. If God wants to take this stuff, fine. But God will always provide food and raiment for me. With food and raiment, therewith be content. The lost world is not content with food and raiment. When you have a brother in Christ that falls away and starts going the way of the world, he's not content with food and raiment. He's got to keep that cost of living, uh, that the way of living that he has and everything. But this is Christ. They were all, and then they saw me highlighting, like the Bible was highlighted. They thought I was, one woman thought I was a pastor. And I was like, no, I just love the word of God and everything. The Lord hasn't really called me to be a preacher or anything. And I tried witnessing to some of the people. And I go into that story, but the point is, is when you're preaching the gospel of peace, you need to have peace about you. You need to have that assurance of salvation. You need to have that blessed hope, the eyes on the blessed hope. What do we uh, be? Um, the Bible says we're supposed to be ready to give them the hope that is in you, to share that hope that's in you with the lost world. I'm not going to hell. I was. And I still deserve to go to hell, but I'm not going to hell. God saved me. I deserve to go there. Okay. Repent. I want to go through the gospel real quick. But brothers and sisters of Christ, gospel tracts, gospel booklets, okay? We need to be handing them out still. I know some brethren have gotten weary. I want to be nice about it. They've gotten weary because they've been putting these out for years and years and years and they get so weary and they feel like this is worthless. But the Bible says, be careful that your work is not in vain. The Bible says when you put this out, if someone reads it, your work is not in vain. Okay, they, right here they see the picture. They can't avoid reading the word hell that's on here. It says hell in big letters. They read that word hell. They say they don't read anything else and they should throw this up. My work is not in vain. Hell is a real place. Okay. Holy Bible, big letters. Okay, you open it up, heaven, big letters. There's Bible verses. Okay. How to be saved and know it. Just reading the title and they throw this book to the side. It's planting seeds. And someone else comes along and waters and says, Hey, that book you threw aside, here's, a, here's another one. And did you read this part here? Did you read this part here? And they start watering the seed that was there. Brothers and Christ, we need, to, are you a part of the ministry of reconciliation? I remember I came across a woman once that she said, I don't feel, God, God's not calling me to preach the gospel. That's for other people, but that's just, that's not for me. She was a false convert. 
Okay. We are all called in the ministry of reconciliation. Cheat. You might not be called into a full-time ministry where you're going out with signs and, and street witnessing and everything, but we're all called to the ministry of reconciliation. You should always be trying to leave gospel tracts places, handing out gospel tracts. When God opens doors, I think we're going to get into some verse about that, when God opens doors, you're to walk through them. When God, when you have a lost family member says, I don't know, I don't know, is there a heaven or a hell? I don't know. That's an open door to start talking to them about sin and the cost of sin, hell, and that there's a way to go to heaven. That Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, made a way for us to go to heaven. Okay? The true plan of salvation. I always take time to preach it. I'm not going to be one of those guys that say, well, you know, I've got a salvation message on my channel, go watch it. No, always take time, brothers of Christ, to preach the gospel. Repentance, the first step in the plan of salvation, repentance. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 says, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. The first thing we tell about is sin and the consequences of sin. Hell, and then the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. And that their personal sins is what's sending them there. They have to have sorrow for that. There has to be sorrow. Or that repent, because there's two types of repentance: godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. It needs to be godly sorrow for it to be the right repentance, for it to work, for their personal sins. I've always said this: people will try to come out, brothers says Christ, try to say we need to say the world's sins as a whole. No, you point out that person specifically and say for your sins, Jesus had to die on the cross personally. I was taught as a false convert that Jesus died for the sins of the world as a whole. And just all you have to do is believe. Head belief. Just believe. Believe. Only believe. All things are possible if you only believe. Faith alone. Faith alone. And they went straight to the faith part. And, oh, okay, you, you believe in your head, you're saved. That's it. No, it needs to be personal. You need to be pointing out each individual person you're preaching to. Your sins are what put them on the cross. You need to repent. And believe. And that leads to the second step. Believe. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I have received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Christ died for our sins. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Feed the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. Right? Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Sins cannot be forgiven or covered. In the Old Testament, they were covered with the animal sacrifices. But sin cannot be taken away without the shedding of blood. God's blood. Okay. How he died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now, brothers and sisters of Christ, I've seen brethren make a mistake here. What's the big mistake? You'll see them say that. Oh, you know, and then the, the, the gospel message, 1 Corinthians 1 through 4, you know how that Jesus died according to the scriptures, and that how he was buried and he rose again according to the scriptures. Now, what did I do wrong there, brother, says Christ? I left out the sin. Why did Jesus die? The Bible says he died for our sins according to the scripture. But lately, be careful, I've seen wolves in sheep's clothing do it. But I've also started to catch brethren that I believe are saved and they preach the true plan of salvation. I see brethren slipping up and they're taking out sins. How he died for our sins, according to the scripture. They leave that out. See, that goes back to part one, repentance. How he died for our sins. Did Jesus die for your personal sins? And did you have sorrow for it when you came to the cross to believe in Jesus Christ? Right. It's so important that you get the right repentance. Worldly sorrow isn't going to save anybody. Okay, What worldly sorrow is, is you're just sorry of the consequences. You're not sorry for who it is you hurt or wronged. You're not, you, you're not, you don't care about that. You're just, care, you're, you're, you're just sorry you got caught. 
You're sorry for the consequences. You're sorry that you love the way of the world, but you're sorry for the consequences of it. You love it, you have no problem with it, but you're just sorry for the, the, for the consequences. That's worldly sorrow. Okay? You have godly sorrow. Okay? And what Jesus did, how he died. He was whipped. He was beaten to the point of death. Like half, I say half to death, but he was beaten really bad. He had his beard ripped out. He was mocked. Okay? He bled out. He bled to death. He was whipped within an inch of his life. He did all that to pay for the sins of the world. You want your sins paid for? You gotta go through Jesus Christ on the cross. Okay? You, when you see that they've done that, now sometimes, brother, said real quick. Sometimes you don't have to hit repentance. If they're already on their knees, they're already crying about how wicked they are and how filthy they are. You don't have to do repentance. They're already in a repentant state. You can skip that and go straight to the belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ. You're not the one going through all the steps. They're the ones that have to go. You already went through all the steps. They're the ones that have to go through all the steps. If you see that they're already repenting, you don't have to rub it in. You can go straight to the next step. They've already, they're already in the first step. But a lot of times we have to preach that first step hardcore today. In the past, it hardly had to be preached because people would always come in a repentant state. Jesus died for my sins. I'm dirty. I'm wicked. I'm worthless. Why would he do that for me? They were already in a repentant state. But today, people are so puffed up. Pride reigns supreme. People going about to establish their own righteousness. I'm a good person. That reigns that right so supreme today. We have to mention repentance a lot today. To get them to that broken point. So we can introduce them to Jesus Christ and what he did for them. Okay? Once they've done those two things, that's the first two steps. The third and fourth steps, this. Confess both in prayers, the third step, and ask God to save you. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. The first time people take God's word and puts it in their heart, guess what it is? It's the gospel. It's what the Bible says about sin, that repentance. What the Bible says about hell. What the Bible says about heaven. The Bible says about Jesus Christ making a way for us to go to heaven. The gospel. That's the first thing that you're hiding in your heart when you get saved. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with and, because it starts in the heart, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. For the scripture saith, whoever... Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Starts in the heart and comes out. Out of the bones of the heart, the mouth speaks. It starts in the heart, and it comes out here. You confess your repentance and belief in Jesus Christ, showing that you're not ashamed. Okay? For there's no difference between the Jew or the Greek, for the Lord is over all is rich unto all that call upon his name. Call means to ask. You ask God to save you. Notice a lot of stuff that you read here, it's unto salvation. For the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Now, I don't want to get into it. We have tons of studies on this channel about gospel, uh, salvation and everything. But it's always unto salvation. But what is salvation ultimately? God, God's grace. God's saving you by His grace. God's the one that says, okay, I've looked at the heart. Your heart is right. We just read about here. It's supposed to be in the heart. And the easy believism people hate that. It's got to be here. Not here. Here. And God looks at the heart, and when you ask God to save you, some of us even beg God, because we don't just, we go, we none of us deserve it, but some of us really had that conviction. We really don't deserve it, and we beg God, please save me, please, Lord, I don't believe, I don't deserve it. And God saves you. He looks at the heart, and God's the one that does the saving. Okay. Now, 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering towards usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's always, throughout the whole Bible, one of the things he is, he's always given man time to repent. He's always about repentance. When you see man sin wicked sins and they repent, God's grace is what saves them. King David, 
ha uh, committed adultery and had a man bur murdered. He should have been put to death. But he repented. He had sorrow for what he did. Godly sorrow. Not worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow. And so on. There's other people. But said, it's always been there. God's always wanted man to repent and turn back to him. Always. All right. The next one is above all taking the shield of faith. That shield. Your belief in this book. Brothers says Christ, how is your belief in this book? This checklist, how is your faith in this book, in the Word of God? There's a lot of, like, we can go around and show that this is God's perfect written Word, and there's a lot of evidence compare, when you compare where this came from versus where all the other Bible perversions came from, the Catholic Bible perversions. And you're like, the King James Bible is God's perfect written Word. Do you believe in this? Well, another faith is faith in the blessed hope. Do you believe in God's precious promises that He gives us in this Bible? Do you believe the dispensations, all the different time periods, including the time of Jacob's trouble and the day of the Lord? Some people say, well, that came spiritually. The day of the Lord came spiritually and it already happened. They don't have faith in this book. Because this book says it hasn't happened because Jesus is going to physically rule and reign for a thousand years. That hasn't happened yet. The animals are not going to eat each other. They're all going to be vegetarians. Herbivores. When did that happen? It hasn't happened yet. Okay. Animals aren't going to kill mankind anymore. At all. You have little babies playing with poisonous snakes. The asp. That hasn't happened yet. When you put down that shield of faith, and people start taking... Right now, the big thing for the brethren is, is there's a big push into the body of Christ lately to take your eyes off Jesus Christ and that blessed hope that... The, you're believing in the imminent return of Jesus Christ is false and you need to stop believing that and you need to take your eyes off Jesus Christ and you need to put it on the world. It's a very bad teaching. Okay, Hebrews 11.1 1 says, let's look at what faith is. Hebrews 11.1. 1. We weren't turning to a lot of them, but sorry. But Hebrews 11.1. 1, I'll turn to this one because this is a very important one. Hebrews, they're all important. But Hebrews 11.1. 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hope for? Like that blessed, looking for that blessed hope? Do you have faith in the blessed hope? Do you have faith that God is going to come back one day and take us home? The catch away the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble? Do you, when the Bible says you are sealed into the day of redemption, do you have faith in that seal? And you have faith in that redemption, that day of redemption. Okay. Okay. Romans 1.17 says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. You have to have faith, brother and sister Christ, true faith. That what God says is truth. And the world, remember what the Bible said about putting on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand from the wiles of the devil. The devil, he cannot prevent anybody from getting saved. He likes to put out as many roadblocks as he can to try to divert people and try to prevent people from finding the way of salvation. But guess what? God, for every one roadblock, I'm just using this as an analogy, for every one roadblock that, that Satan tries to put out, God has 50 to 1,000 roadblocks trying to prevent people from going to hell. I love Peter Ruckman's study on the five surprises of hell. And I do agree with that. God puts out so many roadblocks to prevent someone from going to hell. And Satan's trying to distract people from finding the way. But ultimately, the, 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 the signs are all there. The roadblocks are there. I'm a roadblock. This book is a roadblock. This is a roadblock. This is a roadblock. The magnets on my car is a roadblock. Anytime someone hears someone say, Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for me. Like they're giving God glory and it happens to be out in the open. That's a roadblock. Okay? The Holy Spirit is a roadblock. It goes around and convicts the world of sin. The Bible says that the laws of God are written on every man's heart. Okay? There's so many roadblocks. But the thing that I'm getting to is, is when you do get saved, brothers and sisters in Christ... What Satan tries to do at this point, he can't cause you to lose your salvation, not in this dispensation. There are, there are no unpardonable sins in this dispensation. It's the only dispensation where there's no sin that can't be forgiven. 
When you die in your sins, every sin you've ever committed sends you to hell. Every sin, including the sin of unbelief. Everything sends you to hell. But while you still breathe, there's no sin that can't be forgiven. If you repent and go to the cross, and your life as a Christian, there's no sin that God can't forgive. You're sealed into the day of redemption. Satan can't do nothing about that now. So what does he do next? Well, I can't cause him to lose his salvation, so what do I do? He'll do his best to try to steal your hope, to steal your peace, to steal your joy, to weaken your faith. He'll do everything he can to mess you up as a Christian. That's why the boss says, resist the devil, and he must what? Flee. You have to resist the devil. If you don't resist the devil, he's not going to flee. Okay. You put on the whole armor of God. That's how you withstand from the wiles of the devil. Okay. And what does the devil do with Jesus Christ when he takes him up on the mountain? He, he shows him the kingdoms of the world, and he offers him the world if thou, if thou will fall down and worship me. What does Satan do to Christians that are truly saved, sealed again? He still tries to offer you the world. Oh, come on, it's not that big of a deal. You can enjoy a little bit of this or a little bit of that. And his, his whole thing is he's trying to mess you up greatly. Brothers in Christ, that's why it says above all, taking on that shield of faith, because it takes faith. When you're preaching the gospel, especially in these last days, everything we've talked about so far, girding up your loins, you've got to have faith in this book. Put it on the shield of righteousness. You've got to have faith that what you're doing, no matter how much pressure you're getting from the world, you have faith that this is what God wants for you, and you don't care what the world thinks. You don't care about the persecution. You don't care about the hard times. You don't care about the cost. You have faith that no matter all these things that are hitting you, trying to get you to stop and turn around, you're going to keep going. I believe you, Lord. You know what you're doing, Lord. I trust you, Lord. What's going on in the world? I trust you, Lord. You know what you're doing. What do you need me to do? It takes faith. Okay. Hebrews 11.6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek, them, seek him. Are you looking for that blessed hope? Are you seeking Jesus Christ? with the life that you're living, seeking to go home someday. I'm an ambassador in a faraway land, Lord. I'd really like to come home someday. Remember what Paul said? He said, it strikes between two, to go be with Jesus Christ, which is far better, or to be here for you. And he said, it's more needful to be here for the brethren. We're here to strengthen the brethren and to be a light to this dark world. That's why we're still here, brothers of Christ. There's still people that need to get saved. Okay. When's the last time you heard a preacher preach on we need to get that last soul saved so we can go home? A lot of them turn their back on the pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ when it comes to the imminent return of Jesus Christ. They're not preaching it anymore. Brothers in Christ, we need to get that last soul saved. Do you believe, have faith that I'm still here for a reason? Look, Paul uh, tries to say that your work is not, know that your work is not in vain. The life that you're living, the living testimony, being a shining light for Jesus Christ to the world with the life that you're living. Okay. Victoria. <laughs> She's scratching. With the life that you're living. Okay. You're supposed to have faith. Okay. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. And your faith is expressed through the work that you're doing. Okay. Uh, what is it they said? Faith without works is dead being alone. And it's, it's in James. It's predominantly talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. But for instruction righteousness, yeah, men, that ha men and women that have a lot of faith in this book, you can tell by the life that they're living. Okay, remember whatever in word and deed do all to the glory of God? Word or deed, your actual actions, it's for the Lord. Your words and your deeds need to land up. So if you truly have faith, it's going to show by the life that you're living. Be careful of those that have a lot of talk, 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 talk. I have faith, I have faith, but they're not living it. Be careful. They need to be living it. That's the evidence that they truly have faith. If you truly believe this book is God's perfect written word, why aren't you living it? Brothers and sisters of Christ, how is your faith doing right now? Is it waning? Hmm. 
Romans 3.21 reads, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. In other words, you don't have to go through the law. The law of sin and death, the Levitical laws were nailed to the cross. That you, The lost world has to go still go through those. But we went through the cross. We went through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it was nailed to the cross as far as we're concerned. Without the laws manifested, being witnessed by the law and of the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Repentance. That's what a good verse to use for repentance. For all have sinned. There is no, there's no... There's none that doeth good, no, not one. 24. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation from, through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just, and the justifier of Him which believe in Jesus. Brothers and sisters Christ, that shield of faith, someone comes along and tells you, oh, that gospel, repentance is works. Are you going to fall for it? Repentance happens here. It always happens here. Even in the life of a Christian, that's why you say repent and forsake. The physical action is forsaking that sin. But repentance happens here. Repentance has never been a work. Okay? Repentance always happens here. But you'll have people come along and say repentance is a work. You teach him workspace. Is your faith in the true plan of salvation still? Or are you starting to wane? I know brethren who got saved off this gospel that the King James Bible preaches, and they start hanging out with the wrong crowds, and now they preach that an easy belief is in gospel. They take repentance out. They're saved, but they're, they're those people that are wood and earth and to dishonor. And God will work on them. God will bring them to their knees one way or another. And brother and sister Christ, you have faith in the true plan of salvation. There's, are you sealed? They're trying to take prayer away now and say prayer is a work. Are you falling for the lies and deception of this world? Are you sticking to the King James Bible and having faith in what God's Word says? Uh, you're sealed into the day of redemption. Do you still have faith in that, brothers and Christ? Do you have faith? I say it again. Do you have faith in the seal that God has on you and the day of redemption? Do you have faith in it? They're always trying to take your faith away from you. Do you have faith in His Word? Uh, Romans 10, 8. But what saith it? The Word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is, the Word of faith which we pre preach. So I've said it before, but there's a word here. Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word. Brother says, Christ, how's your faith doing right now? It's one of the checklists. Lord, how's my faith doing? Am I starting to falter? Am I starting to backpedal? Am I starting to resurrect the old man? Am I, start go am I starting to go the way of the world? Am I starting to become covetous? Lord, is my faith starting to be put in physical things instead of you, Lord? Well, I can save myself these hard times that might come, and it might come. These hard times that come, I can save myself. Or is our faith still in Jesus Christ? There's nothing wrong with, like I said, uh, they're trying to get you to prep, prep, prep for like seven years. Okay, I won't be going through the time of Jacob's trouble. I don't need to prep for seven years. I trust the Lord. I have faith in the Lord. I store up enough food for a season. There's nothing wrong with that. But do you believe in the Lord and have faith in the Lord? Or are you starting to look out in the world and you're starting to lose faith in the Lord and you're starting to think, well, I, I better start doing stuff for myself. And I need to start saving myself. And I need to... Do you have faith in the Lord? That food that's in that pantry there, it'll keep me going. I mean, I could really stretch it out, and it'll keep me going for two, two and a half years. Because I've learned a can, I, we are talking about this, uh, can, uh, there's bear meat, there's uh, tuna. I went on a tuna trip and got lots of jars of tuna and stuff like that. And I've got rice and bags and bags of rice and stuff like that. And it's like, I've got food in there that if I really wanted to stretch it out, it could probably go two, two and a half years. But you know what? That food ain't going to save me. I have faith that God will watch over me. God, I heard a testimony where someone had their food pantry because something got caught on fire or something and burned all the food in their food pantry. Just like that. Anything can happen to that food just like that if God wants it to. Where is your faith at? Is it in what you're doing or is it in what God's doing? Now if what you're doing is what God says to do, then your faith is in what God's doing <laughs> and what God says to do. But I'm talking about what's going on in the world. Didn't mean to get off on too much of a 
sidetrack on that, but faith, brother says Christ, without faith it is impossible to please him. Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When you have that shield out, you know what else that your faith can do? Your faith can strengthen the faith of others. Romans 1, 12 we read, that is that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. It's Paul speaking. Our faith can strengthen one another. Our faith can, uh, with your faith, helps strengthen one another and reminds us to keep our shields up. To have that faith. Okay? I can come with my shield of faith and let's say you put yours down. I come with my shield of faith and say, brother, you're starting to wane. You're starting to fall. The end of the return of Jesus Christ is truth. The Bible says we're supposed to be look, pre looking, present tense. We're supposed to be looking every day, and we're going to do this in the next study. How do you look for the, the blessed hope? We're supposed to be looking every day for it with the life that we're living. You put down your shield, and you got brothers like, oh, oh, you're right, brother, I'm sorry, and he picks up his shield. You strengthen one another. As iron sharpeneth iron, you know, when it comes to the Word of God. We strengthen one another in the Word of God when we both study the Word of God and we're preaching, we quote scriptures at each other. I miss that with a lot of the brethren. We used to quote scripture back and forth a lot. doesn't happen that much anymore. Okay. 1 Corinthians 2.5 says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Okay. Your faith needs to be in this book. It needs to be in the truth that God saved you, you're sealed, and you're on your way to heaven. That day of redemption is coming someday. I need to live for the Lord today. The Lord's word says, ministry of reconciliation. We need to try to lead as many people to that blessed hope that we have. The Bible says before we were saved, we were without hope and without God in the world. I can't imagine today, I cannot imagine having one day without God and without that hope. Some brethren are starting to lose faith in that hope. And we're supposed to help strengthen one another. Jesus is coming back someday, and it could be today. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you putting on the whole armor of God? Faith can be in vain. Did you know that, brother and sister Christ? 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, And now by the faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Whole another study. Remember, charity is it's self-sacrifice. Okay? We're supposed to have hope. 13, And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. One of the biggest things you'll see with the easy believism is there's no resurrection with the easy believism. And, I'm, and please hear me out. If you come across this, and I love the, there's no resurrection in the easy believism. The old man is not dead and buried with easy believism. You can continue living like the old man, and you can continue living how you were before you got saved as if there was nothing wrong. I mean, like, why did you get saved? Oh, just for a free pass to heaven, or to be part of this group. I just, you know, I wanted, I, I wanted the consequences done away with, so that I can be free to continue in my sin without the consequences. But they've been lied to. The Bible says if you live after the flesh, you shall die. There's still, even for Christians that are saved, there's still physical consequences to sin today. When we get saved and still in the day of redemption, we're not going to hell anymore. The ultimate consequences of sin, the law of sin and death, death gets dropped. We're freed from the death part, but the law of sin still applies. Even to a Christian. You live after the flesh, you shall die. But they're getting lied to that the consequences are done away with and they can continue living however they want and there's no resurrection. Where's the new creature in Christ Jesus? Where's the new birth? Oh, it's just going from unbelief to belief. No, it isn't. The new birth, the old man is dead and buried. The way the old man thought, belief is part of it, faith is part of it, but it's not just going from unbelief to belief. It's saying, Lord, I'm yours. Please give me a new life. I can't stand this wicked man that's on his way to hell. That wicked man that's on his way to hell is dead and buried at the cross. Or dead and buried with Jesus Christ in the tomb. And the new man is raised with Jesus Christ. Okay? But your faith can be in vain. There's a lot of these people that they say, yes, I believe in a Jesus Christ. But I love my life down here. I'm not, I have no sorrow for my sins. I'm not going to change my... I'm not trading in this life... I love this life. Their faith is in vain. 
1 Corinthians 15, 17 says, And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Hmm. Faith is vain when you do when you do not put your faith into action. James 2, 17. Even so, faith, if it's not, if it have not worked, is dead being alone. Okay, are you risen with Jesus Christ? New creature in Christ Jesus. If any man be in Christ, all things are passed away. You can't read this bottom part, though, because I'm blocking it and the table. All things are become new. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All things. God gives you a new life. Your attitude towards sin changes. Your attitude towards the world changes. Your attitude towards this wicked body of flesh changes. Your well, Romans 8, 1 says that you're spiritually minded, walking after the Spirit. The whole chapter of Romans 8. You're spiritually minded and walking after the Spirit. The old man is carnally minded, walking after the flesh. There's a change. A lot of people don't want that change. They hate that change. Okay. Can faith be in vain? Yeah. When you don't believe in the true resurrection of Jesus Christ with the life that you live. They go hand in hand. Remember what I said before? You can say one thing, and if you're doing another, what your actions are what dictate what you really believe. You can say, I believe in the resurrection, I believe in the resurrection. It doesn't mean squat if you're not living it. Well, I believe in the pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ. Then are you present tense looking for Jesus Christ to come back any day now? Are you looking for that blessed hope? Oh, no, I don't believe in that. Then your word is vain. Your so-called belief is vain because you're not living it. You're not living it. Okay. Mark 9, 24, we read, And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Brother says Christ, how often do you say that? I say it sometimes. When I see that, I, I even hear, hear some voice trying to like talk me out of the absolute truth, get me to doubt the imminent return of Jesus Christ and living for him every day. What's going on in the world is trying to distract me, uh, my own temp fleshly temptations and Lord help my belief help me believe I believe help thou my own belief. Lord don't let this sway me. Lord don't let me fall. I don't want to be in a fallen state when you come back. I don't want to be falling flat on my face when you come back, Lord. What this man was saying is he believed, and Lord, have mercy on him when he starts faltering. Help thou my unbelief. When he starts faltering, help strengthen that belief that's there. When we get into the watch, you're supposed to watch and strengthen the things that remain. Lord, help strengthen the faith that's here, Lord. Don't let my faith be vain. Let me continue to be a light to you with the, the changed life. The biggest thing is I had the, uh, the Change Life Gospel. We went to a study where we explained what it means in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, when it talks about, unless you have believed in vain. And that whole chapter, when you keep reading, it talks about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The old man is dead and buried. You're supposed to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. Where's the new creature in Christ Jesus? Your faith is in vain. Your belief is worthless. The belief in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is worthless. Because you didn't believe, truly believe in the resurrection with the life that you're living. Now, like I said, you can walk along as a Christian and fall flat on your face. God will pick you back up. Flat on your face, God will pick you back up. There are some Christians that fall flat on their face. They go strong for a while and they fall flat on their face. And they're the wood and hay. Or the wood and uh, earth. They're the ones to dishonor. And God will deal with those through chastening. It's a whole other thing, but the chastening of the Lord. God will work on them and get them back up somehow. He'll either get them out or he'll take them up. Okay. But brothers and sisters in Christ, okay. trying to remember where I left off. <laughs> Word number five. Uh, the, the helmet of salvation, the next one, for this Christ, the faith. You need to work on that faith. Don't let anybody waver that faith. The faith in the major doctrines, the true plan of salvation, eternal security, dispensational teaching, 
the Bible version issue. That this is God's perfect written word, the King James Bible in English. Okay? Um, the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catch away the body of Christ. The Godhead. What true liberty is. Okay? Don't let people persuade you. Okay? Don't let them mess you up and, change, and get you to lose faith in what the Bible says about these things. The next piece of armor is the helmet of salvation. 1 Thessalonians 5.8 is where we read this. It says, But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and the helmet, the hope of salvation. This helmet, people will try to say, and we've done a study on this, this helmet, people will try to say, it's just when you got saved. You know? The first time Jesus came into your heart. That's what it's talking about. No, because this says... The hope of salvation. That means it hasn't happened yet, but you hope it will someday. I'm truly saved and born again, sealed into the day of redemption according to the Bible, and I tr have faith in that. So it's not talking about that. What's it talking about? It's talking about the blessed hope. Titus 2.13. Looking for that blessed hope in the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. There are people taking off their helmet and putting it down. Oh, Jesus isn't coming back for another five or six years, so they take that helmet off and they put it down. Are you taking that helmet off and putting it down, brother and sister Christ? Are you getting deceived into doing it? When you look to see what's going on out in the world, behind this is the window, and out there is the, the trees and everything. The world is supposed to motivate you to keep that helmet on. Most helmets, when you're fighting, has a nose piece here, and has two side pieces here, and you can only see forward. You've really got to turn your body and your head to look to the right, or to look to the left. So when you do that, you're really going out of your way to look to the left and look to the right. You're supposed to be focused on this and the Lord. Are you looking for that blessed hope every day? Okay. That's what that helmet is. Are you putting on that helmet and looking for that blessed hope? And we'll get into another study of what looking is. What are you looking? Talking about the blessed hope. All right. Lamentations 3.26 says, It is good. Lamentations 3.26 It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. We're supposed to have that hope in us and we're supposed to be quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. We preach the gospel and everything but we're not supposed to be trying to change the world and be entangled with the affairs of this life. We're quietly and patiently waiting for the salvation of God. We're not fully redeemed yet. How many of you heard that before? You're not fully redeemed. You're just two-thirds redeemed. My soul is redeemed. My soul used to be connected to my body, and the sin of my body would taint my soul. When I got saved, that spiritual circumcision, my body is now, my soul, I'm sorry, my soul is now connected to Jesus Christ. That's why we're called the body of Christ. And my flesh is no longer connected to my soul. My soul has been redeemed. My spirit's been redeemed. Before I was saved, I was spiritually dead. I couldn't discern anything spiritually. I was spiritually dead. Now that I'm saved, the Holy Spirit comes in and quickens my spirit. I am now alive, spiritually alive. They're both redeemed, but this body of flesh isn't redeemed. We're qu I'm waiting. It's, I wish I was quietly waiting. Sometimes I get up there and I'm talking with the Lord saying, Why hasn't it happened yet? And the Lord, Lord puts me back in my place and says, Hey, have faith. If, if it didn't happen today, it'll, it could happen tomorrow. Keep the faith. God's not going to tell me when it's going to happen. I'm supposed to live every day as if it could happen today. And so are you, brothers and sisters in Christ. And some of you have turned your back on it. 1 John 3, 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Once again, separation from the world. Be not conformed to this world. Amen. We're ambassadors in a foreign land. Verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Future tense. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be likened like him. For we shall see him as he is, and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. So when you have this hope of that blessed hope, and you're looking for that blessed hope, you're going to purify yourself in the life that you're living today. You're going to make sure, okay, Lord, sanctification. Is there anything bad I need to get out of my life? Is there things I'm not doing for you, Lord, that I'm supposed to be doing? Am I staying in the book in the morning, in this book? 
every morning and every evening, reading the Word of God, studying the Word of God. Am I singing hymns? Am I giving you glory in all things, Lord? Or am I starting to take glory for myself? I know a brother in Christ that he's, he's, he's having a hard time giving God glory for everything. He's starting to take glory for himself, and it's puffing him up. Am I getting prideful, Lord? Am I getting bitter? Am, you know, am I getting covetous? And you go through the whole list and all this stuff. Is there anything that's getting in the way of you and me, Lord, and my walk with you? Is there anything that's getting in the way of me looking for you, Lord? The blessed hope. You start purifying yourself. That's the evidence of someone who truly believes in that blessed hope. They're going to live a life of Christ. They're going to do their best that when Jesus comes back, I want Jesus to look, tell me, well done, thou good and faithful one. Well done, thou good and faithful one. That's our heart's desire. Like I said, in my life, there's times I've failed the Lord, and it's like, here's your penny. And there's times I felt like, God's going to say, well done, good and faithful one. And you kind of tend to bounce around. But ultimately, I want the, God, please, please, Lord, I want, I want to please God. I want Him to be pleased with me. Ephesians 2.12 we read, That at that time ye were without Christ, being alien from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope, this is where we get that verse, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who are sometimes who are far off are made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. We now have that hope. We've been adopted in. We've got that hope. Brothers and sisters in Christ, when you put on that helmet for a hope of salvation, that means you're looking for Jesus to come back with the life that you're living every day. And you don't turn your back on it. Jesus could come back today. If he doesn't, and then we get to the next, and we get to tomorrow. Let's say yesterday, Jesus. I was like, my attitude was, Jesus could come back today. I was looking up at the clouds. Is today the day, Lord? Were you pleased with me today? Did we, did we get enough? Did I get the things done that we've had on our list? Because I try to put things on a list every day. Let's get this done. This Bible study is on the list today. Uh, it was on the list yesterday, but the camera failed on me, and I lost three hours of preaching on the memory card. It was, it wouldn't play. So we're doing this again, Lord. But you got your list. Am I living for you? That's what it means to look for that blessed hope. He didn't come back yesterday. Does it mean I just turned my back on that blessed hope? No. Today I have that same attitude. Lord, could you come back today? What needs to get done today? What needs to get done today? 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. What does the Bible say? That word have I hid in my heart? Sanctify thy truth, thy word is truth. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Remember what I said with the people when the fire was going on here and I got relocated, had to evacuate? We were in a, a grade school, I think it was, sleeping in cots <laughs> and, uh, in the uh, gym. I laugh a little bit because I snore, and I've heard other people snoring that when I was there. But I, I was there to offer him hope. What's the hope? Jesus Christ. I know where I'm going someday. God could come any day now and take me home to my real home. If I die, I know where I go. I have that hope. We're supposed to give that hope when someone asks us, Why are you so why aren't you sorrowful? Why aren't you feeling like you're gonna lose all this stuff? You can lose your house, everything can burn down, you can lose it all. Why aren't you upset or something? Why aren't you acting like the lost world? Because I'm not like the lost world. I have that hope in me. Let me tell you about that hope. See how that's an opener? God opens doors. All right. uh, sixth, the sixth thing, the sword of the Spirit. Got three more things, brothers and sisters. Please bear with me. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now we talked about how you're supposed to gird up your loins, you're supposed to study it. But brothers and sisters in Christ, you're supposed to make sure that you have God's perfect written word in your hands. I've done the study on the Bible version issue. Okay? The King James Bible is God's perfect written word. Are you reading it every day? You study it, but are you just reading it to keep it sharp? You keep it sharp here and here. Memorizing scripture. Okay? Reading it all the time. I find that if I go without reading it for a while, I have a hard time trying to recall verses. I have a really hard time trying to recall verses. You're supposed to keep your sword sharp. You're supposed to have this, and you're supposed to be reading it every day. You might go a day without studying or two, 
But are you still reading it every day? You still need to study it. That's why the brethren come together uh, for house churches. You're supposed to come together once a week, twice a week, and you listen to some good Bible preaching, Bible studies. But every day are you reading this book and hiding it in your heart and you keeping it sharp? 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Four things. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. Now I talked with somebody who was trying to push me into giving up my belief on the, imminent, uh, the catching away of the body of Christ, which goes hand in hand before the time of Jacob's trouble. He believes we're going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. And as we were talking, I kept saying, why do you keep grabbing from the Old Testament? He keeps grabbing predominantly from the Gospels, where, uh, like Matthew 24, Mark 13, I think it is, Luke 23 or so. There's chapters and stuff, but he kept grabbing from the Gospels, which is Old Testament, where Jesus is preaching the kingdom of God, which, sometimes, which can mean the... The kingdom of heaven is always the physical kingdom. The kingdom of God can be a reference to the physical kingdom or the heavenly kingdom. He purposely grabbed the verse that said kingdom of God to make me think it's heavenly. And I said, okay, let's look at the parallel passages. And you look at the parallel passages and it said kingdom of heaven in one of them. And I said, okay, so now all of this is talking about the physical kingdom. This is talking about the day of the Lord. Going through the time of Jacob's trouble leading into the day of the Lord. That's not for us today. Why are you quoting so much stuff? And taking it out of context. Remember we said when you're growing up your loins with truth, you're supposed to rightly divide the word of truth. And while I was talking with him, what, what he got so messed up in is he thought that doctrine, reproof, and correction, instruction, and righteousness could be found in every verse in the Bible. That's not what this says. He says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, and righteousness. You're going to find one at least one of those. Sometimes you might find two. You might find three. And sometimes you might find all four in one, pa in one passage. But you're going to find at least one of those in those verses, in the Bible. It's not guaranteed that it's going to have all four in every verse of all the Bible. Okay? And when you rightly divide, you've got to understand there's doctrine for the Old Testament that's not for today. We have our own doctrine for today. Okay, we're in a different dispensation. Verse 17, but why do you keep reading the Word of God and reminding yourself the studies you did when you just read the Bible? I find myself talking about studies I did in the past or studies that I've watched other brethren do. Peter Ruckman, I said other brethren. And uh, I'm looking in here, and that's, what, that's why you read, to keep it fresh in your heart and fresh in your mind. That's why you read every day, to sharpen that sword. Why? Verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I could have learned a study that, uh, I could have done a study or watched a study that said, stay away from this so I get it out of my life. Then all of a sudden, sometimes I like to say, I don't know how it happened. I know how. I let it back in. You let it back in. You let it back in and you're doing your daily reading and all of a sudden you come across that verse that hits your heart and convicts you and says, wait a second. And it reminds you of that study that that you watched. I need to get that back out again. So I let it back in again. Lord, forgive me. And you get it back out. You keep the sword sharp. You don't let it go dull. You let it go dull when you stop reading this book. Okay. Now, do you have God's perfect written word? Proverbs 27, 17. We talked about, do you have God's perfect written word? This, I left the books. I should have grabbed them, but I have the Texas Receptus King James Bible is backed by over 99% of all the Greek extant manuscripts today. Over 99%. The, the Nestle's Alon is backed by less than 1%. All the other Bible perversions are backed by less than 1%. This is 99% tested, tried, and proved. All the other Bible perversions, less than 1%. And when you ever get into a discussion with someone when it comes to the perfect written word of God, you'll see them talk about a lot of feelings and opinions, traditions of men, culture, world's way of looking at the word of God. And what has God done about the wisdom of this world? He's made foolish the wisdom of this world. I'll have nothing to do with those Bible versions. I bur burned all my Bible versions. Okay? People say, what if you want to do a teaching? At this point, this is the word of God. 
when I get caught up and someone comes in here, I want them to find nothing but absolute truth. Even if it has a sign on, even if you try to put a sticker on it saying, this is false, this is false, it'll still confuse them. Trust me, it'll still confuse them. I just want nothing but absolute truth in this, in this office. Okay? Make sure you have God's perfect written word that you truly believe in. This goes back to that shield of faith. They all, see how they all connect together. Make sure that you have God's perfect written word and you're hiding it in your heart and you're reading it every day. Proverbs 27, 17 is where we get that. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. When you read this book every day, you can hold one another accountable to the word of God and encourage the brethren to stand fast to it no matter what is going on in the world or the hardship of their own lives. When you read this book over and over and over, and just listen to it, because I listen to Alexander Scorvey read it over and over and over, you can have someone that, that's hurting, and God will go, there's that verse, there's that verse, and there's that verse. Send those three verses to him, to encourage him. And you do. But if you let this go to the side, and it starts collecting dust, and you see a brother or sister in Christ hurting, you're like, I, I should give him a verse of some kind, but... Lord, I've, I've forgotten. Lord, what, what do I... That's the Lord's way of saying you need to get back into the Word of God. You need to make sure that this book stays sharp. It's iron sharpens iron. It's talking about us, each other, but we do it with the Word of God. You need to keep this sharp. And we need to be talking about the Word of God. And when you go to correct someone, you use the Word of God. When you go to encourage someone, you use the Word of God. When someone's faith seems to be dwindling, you use the Word of God to strengthen their faith. Your faith in the Word of God strengthens their faith. But you use the Word of God. Okay. Okay, I put holding one another accountable to the Word of God and encouraging the brethren to stand fast to it no matter what is going on in the world. Remember, the world's trying to distract people in these last days. What's ever going on in the world or whatever hardships going on in their own life, we're supposed to encourage the brethren to stay true to this book. Stay to the path. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Are you ready? Are you reading it every day, brethren? Or have you been distracted by the world and the flesh? 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of hope that is in you in the meekness of fear. I did that verse again because we talked about the hope side, but now it's the answer side. How do we give that hope and that answer? Through the Word of God. Are you reading it every day? Are you keeping it fresh in your heart and in your mind? That when someone comes to you, you can help them out. So you see someone getting distracted, if I start getting distracted, I won't help, brother, says Christ. Shoot me some scriptures to encourage me to stop being distracted and get focused. Okay? Please, brother, says Christ. Remember that's good. That's for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. If I'm doing something wrong, remind me what the Bible says. And then if you have to correct me, correction, then you correct someone the Bible way. Remember we said we did a whole study on it. And meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. In meekness, okay, in a sincerity and truth, you don't correct somebody by mocking them and name calling them. You correct somebody in sincerity and in truth. You do it with meekness. Okay. Okay. James 1 21 says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive. With the meekness, the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Now, I understand James is a transition book for the Jews going into the time of Jacob's trouble. Those who reject Jesus Christ today are going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. But the instruction of righteousness is there. We have the word of God here. The engrafted word that's able to save your soul. And we're supposed to engraft it here. We're supposed to be ready to preach the gospel. We're supposed to be ready to give that hope, that blessed hope. Preach the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. We're supposed to be able to preach, just talk about doctrine and instruction and in righteousness. Talk about our faith. The Bible says that we're supposed to uh, talk about, we're supposed to share our faults one with another. Not, we're not supposed to confess our sins. We're supposed to confess our faults one with another. When's the last time, brothers of Christ, you've confessed your fault to anybody? 
my fault up here. I, I already mentioned it. I struggle. I was very, before I was saved, I was very addicted to Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, and porn. Those are the four big, big addictions. Okay? God got those things out of my life. But there's still a struggle up here every once in a while. Movies start coming in. I'll be thinking of one thing, and then I'll remember it in a movie, and then I'll start be running, and I'll start running through that movie through, all in my head. How many of you do the same thing? TV shows, video games. I'll think of one thing that seems to be innocent, but because it was in a video game, or because it was in a Hollywood movie or a TV show, my flesh grabs onto it and starts trying to pull me in a direction I don't want to go. And I'm like, uh, Lord, forgive me. Mm -hmm. That's only because we've gra I've engrafted the God's word here that helps me overcome it. God overcomes it for me through his word that I've engrafted here, that I've hid in my heart. Mm -hmm. Brothers and sisters in Christ, make sure that you're staying in the word of God every day. When, how often do you read the Bible? There's some brethren that says, oh, I still read the Bible once a day. Yeah, but if you go back far enough, was there a time that you read the Bible more than once a day? Oh, yeah, there was a time I read the Bible two or three times a day, and I was watching three or four studies a week and everything. And Can you go back and find out when that stopped? And then try to look in and say, what stopped you from doing it? What got in the way? Get that thing that got in the way out so you can go back to reading the Bible twice. You know, starting your day, ending your day, watching three or four studies a day, praying all every day. Praying all the time. When that starts coming down to where it's very small, something's getting in the way, brother says Christ, and you need to find out what it is and get out and get rid of it. Uh, 2 Peter 1.20 Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scriptures is of any private interpretation. Brother and sister Christ, the reason we have the sword of God, the sword, and we keep the sword on us, is because this book right here is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Our precious promises, that blessed hope, how we got saved, how we lead other people to Christ, how we react to this wicked world, everything that has to do with how we live our lives today comes from this book. Everything. People will get on to, oh, what about the truck? I don't need the truck. It's a blessing from the Lord. But the Bible says man should not live by bread alone. So the Bible understands we live by bread, but not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The okay? Bible says if man doesn't work, neither shall he eat. We're supposed to work to get our food. Okay? God knows this. God talks about how the lilies of the field, God takes care of the wild animals and the wild flowers and everything that's out there. How much more will God take care of you? God understands these things. People always try to nitpick, nitpick, because they don't want this book to be their final authority anymore. They want culture to be their final authority. They want worldly heritage. They want... Um, Church fathers, history to be their final authority. Mankind to be their final authority. The flesh to be their final authority. Brother and sister Christ, this book is your final authority. What place does this book hold in your life? Is this the foundation? Right now, one of my biggest prayers that I pray, brother and sister Christ, is that no matter what happens, how bad it gets out there, or how bad my flesh gets, and I'm not talking about sin this time, I'm talking about age, he said, no matter how bad my eyes get, you know, my ears get, my vocal cords get, I told the Lord, I said, Lord, to the very end, Lord, let me be able to read your word, hear your word, and speak your word. Please, Lord. Right? That's the foundation that this book has in my life. I need God's word in my life. Every day. Going a day without sometimes now is starting to get to me. Just going a day without reading, praying, it gets to me. It bugs me. Because my something's wrong with the foundation. I'm starting to lose the foundation. Brothers, this Christ, how is this book in your life? Do you hold it in high regards? It's your sword. Okay. Seven. Praying and supplication. Okay. What is supplication? I had to look up the word supplication. 
It means humbly, it's humble and earnest prayer and worship, petition, earnest request. You know why it says prayer and supplication? Why did it just say prayer, period? Because, brothers and Christ, the Bible says, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, that we're to pray without ceasing. I pray about everything and anything. When I'm sitting down on the deck, I pray with the Lord. When I'm cooking uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I'm praying to the Lord. When I'm cleaning house, I'm praying to the Lord. When I'm working on the property, I'm praying to the Lord. When I go to town and walk on the beach, I'm doing cue cards, and I'm talking with the Lord, I'm praying. I pray for the brethren. Okay? We pray without ceasing, but there are certain times that you're going to have supplication, which means you're going to be praying about something specific, and it's very important. It's an earnest prayer. Lord, I'm going to take time out to, to stop everything I'm doing, and I'm going to sit here, or even kneel here, and say, this is very important, Lord, I need to pray. And I need to focus 100% on this prayer, because this is very important. It's supplication. You humble yourself, you get on your knees, and it's an earnest prayer. Not that all prayers, it's just that we're supposed to talk with God, we're supposed to have a relationship with the Lord. But there's some prayer that's going to be earnest, like my prayer for the brethren in these last days. A lot of the brethren are starting to get distracted by the world, they're starting to go the way of the world, they're starting to become worldly. They might verbally profess to still believe in the stands, but their life that they're living doesn't line up with this book. They're starting to cave in. And I'm praying for them. There's a huge drama going on online. Just people love drama. They love drama, drama, drama. Throw in a little drama and you can get more views. And that kind of junk and garbage. And ministries becoming talk shows and everything. It's like, brothers is Christ. A lot of backbiting and whispering is going on. And I meant that as an earnest prayer for this month. Prayer, pray hardcore. Take some time out. Stop doing everything. And either sit there on the deck like I do and just pray earnestly and hardcore or get on, even get on your knees and pray hardcore for the brethren. That those of us who are still standing remain standing and those that have fallen, that they get back up. That's an earnest prayer. One of, or another example of an earnest prayer is in my chicken coop, I've got mites. And I've completely flushed it out and gotten rid of all the stuff. And I'm trying to do all the, these advice. i got ash sitting there for the chickens to bathe. They do their dirt. They bathe in dirt. They kick dirt everywhere that's supposed to kill the bugs and help keep the bugs off of them and everything. And they do the dirt bathing. But they said with the mites, you got to do, you got to sprinkle in ash with the dirt. And that ash kind of repels them and gets them to leave and, uh, the, the, the chickens. But right now I have a huge infestation that I got rid of, but it keeps coming back and I'm doing everything I can. It's like, it's a struggle and it's a fight and it becomes an earnest prayer where I'm, I'm not the point, I'm not to fall on my knees and pray, uh, Lord, help me. This, it's an earnest prayer. And if you want to pray with me, brothers Christ, I could really use some help, but I just don't want that to be the focus this month. I'm using it as an example for me for you, Brother Christ, I, my prayer request to you guys for this month was that you pray for the brethren. It's more important that the brethren gets, that are standing stay standing and the ones that are fallen get back up. That's more important than that chicken coop. But I'm using it as an example of what it means by earnest prayer. Prayer and supplication. 2 Timothy 1.3 says, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with a pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Praying for the brethren every day, night and day. Romans 1 9 says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayer. You know, one thing that you should be praying for every day, period? Are you praying for the brethren every day? What's, what's going on as a soldier for Jesus Christ? Are you praying for the brethren that they keep the whole armor of God on, they may stand against the wiles of the devil, that they don't get distracted by the world? They don't get distracted by their flesh. Are you praying for the brethren in these last days? We desperately need it. Paul was always praying for them. Acts 12.5 we read, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto, him, unto God for him. When brethren have prayer requests, are you praying hardcore for them? When they're going through trials and tribulation, when they're going through hard times, are you praying for them? Are you praying for some of the brethren overseas? That they're going through a lot worse time than we are here. But our time's coming. If God tarries, our time's coming here in America. 
but we're going to start going through some really hard times if God tarries. Are you praying for the brethren? When they have prayer requests, are you just saying, oh yeah, that's a prayer request? Are you taking it seriously and praying for them? John 17, 9, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Brother says, Christ, hear me out. When it comes to the lost world, my ultimate prayer and my only prayer for them for the most part is this. That God gives them every opportunity to get saved and he uses me. Okay, he uses me. I still want to lead someone to Christ face to face. Online, I, I, I leave out gospel tracts. I might have led people to Christ through gospel tracts. I might have led people to Christ online. But I would love to lead someone to Christ face to face. Physically be there preaching with my own, with not my own words, I must say, but preaching with words out of my mouth, the God's word that's hidden in my heart coming out of my mouth. Not them reading it or online. I want to lead people to, to Christ face to face. But my prayer for the lost world is that God gives them every opportunity to get saved and that he uses me as an ambassador for, for him, an ambassador for Jesus Christ, and for the ministry of reconciliation. That's there. Don't get me wrong. That's there. You're praying for loved ones to get saved, to come to the knowledge of the truth. There's nothing wrong with that. But predominantly, Paul's saying, my prayer is for those that are saved. I'm praying for those that are saved. Because remember, he used to say, he prayed the, uh, the Jews... His, his kinship according to the flesh, that they might be saved. He prayed for them to be saved. But other than that, he didn't cross that line. You don't pray that good things happen to lost people. You pray that they get saved. What you're doing is you're praying for the brethren. Are you praying for the brethren predominantly every day? I am. There's days that I wasn't. And there's days that I might fail to do that. And God's going to have to you know, smack me upside the head and say, Did you pray? Did you pray for the brethren? All right. Romans 10.9 Before we get to Romans 10.9 um, are you When you pray, you're, every day you should be praying for the brethren and every day you should be going to the Lord and confessing your sins. Not to me. We confess our faults one to another. But confess your sins. Lord, did I screw up today? I always apologize. Even if it's just a thought that came in for like five seconds that I shouldn't have had at, at the end of the day, I sat there and I talked to the Lord. I apologize for all the thoughts, bad thoughts I did, for not getting things done on our list, Lord, that, you know, for getting distracted. If I got distracted, if I failed the Lord physically, then you need to be repenting every day, Brother Christ. You need to be praying to the Lord and asking for forgiveness every day. You need to be praying for the brethren every day. You need to be praying for yourself as far as, Lord, Help me keep the armor of God on. Help me to look for that blessed hope. Help me to live for you every day, Lord. Even if I had a great day living for the Lord, I would still pray, Lord, please, please help me. Make sure I don't get prideful. Make sure I don't get bitter. I've gotten prideful before. I've been bitter before. I've been all these things before. Lord, I don't want these things in my life again. Are you praying? That's part of being a good soldier for Jesus Christ is praying. Oh, but that's a work according to some people. No, it comes from the heart. Out of the abundance of the mouth, the heart speaks. Prayer is not a work. Right. Romans 10.1 Now, if you're doing an earnest prayer where you're getting on your knees and everything, that physical act is a work. But the actual prayer itself, that's you humbling yourself before you pray. But the actual prayer itself is not a work. Mm -hmm as far as earning your way to salvation. We'll say it that way to, to satisfy some people to a point. It has nothing to do with earning salvation. Prayer is not a work like that. Right. Romans 10.1 Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for God, for Israel, is that they might be saved. There's that verse. So you have Paul, he's praying for salvation for lost people. There's nothing wrong with praying for salvation for lost people, and that's not a contradiction. What Paul is saying, though, is, is when it comes to my main prayer, I pray that the lost world gets saved. Lord, give them every opportunity to get saved. My family members, give them every opportunity to get saved. But he prays for them, but he focuses, goes back, it's done, he goes back to focusing and praying hardcore for the brethren. 
Philippians 4, 6 reads, Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. Let your requests be made known unto God. So every day you're praying for the brethren. You're, you're confessing your sins your, that you've done, whether you've thought them or you've physically done them. Uh, you're praying for requests. You're making requests. Lord, please help me with this situation. I mentioned the chicken coop. Help me with the chicken coop, Lord. Lord, help me with this. Lord, we're going to get to the point where we open the scriptures, okay? Um, I actually don't have that one down here, but there's the verse that talks about that he gives to all men liberally and embraceth not. If he had went wisdom, let him ask of God to give it to all men liberally and embraceth not. You make your request be made known unto God, whether it has to do with opening the scriptures to you or something in your life that you need help with. Lord, help me. I need help. Those are the three things that you may predominantly should be praying every day. Your walk with the Lord and the brethren's walk with the Lord. And requests. Your walk with the Lord includes this Bible, opening this Bible to you. Your walk with the Lord, you pray for the brethren's walk with the Lord, and any requests that you have with the day-to-day -day life that you live for the Lord. Right. And why is prayer so important? Why is prayer so important? Revelation 5.8 and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. When you're not holding iniquity in your heart, God keeps your prayers. He keeps everyone's prayers. He doesn't forget them. Okay. Someone once said that um, silence is an abs uh, abs how do I say it? absence. I want to say it right. Silence is not absence. Just because God didn't answer your prayer right on the spot doesn't mean God didn't hear it. That God isn't with you. Okay? He keeps all the prayers. And God knows what's best for us. And God will take care of us. Remember what our need is. Food and raiment. My, my prayer when it comes to supplication, thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Most of my requests are simply that. They're wants. I don't need it. My needs have been made, are been taken care of. I still pray for them. God gave them to me. My food and raiment. I still thank God every day for them, and I pray that God always provides food and raiment. You say, "Well, God said He would. Why would you pray for that? To show that I don't deserve it. To humble myself. God promised food and raiment, but I'm still going to humble myself. Lord, thank you for this food and raiment. I don't deserve it. Thank you, Lord. Please, please always provide food and raiment, Lord. Lord, your Bible. Please, Lord. I want to always be able to read it, hear it, and speak it, Lord. Please, Lord. Help me to hide this in my heart so if they take this away, I still have your word here that I can just say in my head over and over. Because I've got it here. Okay. What gets we didn't I didn't do any verses for this, but what gets in the way of prayer? And we talked about this in other studies. But what gets in the way of prayer, real quick? Sin. Sin is the biggest thing that gets in the way of of, of prayer. You know, your flesh gets in the way. You start falling in the trap of backbiting, whispering, pride, bitterness, fear of the world, drama, covetousness, which is idolatry. We can go on and on. Worldliness, fleshliness, sin. These are things that get in the way of your prayer life, brothers and sisters of Christ. When you realize, I don't pray as much as I used to, something happened in your life. Backtrack the timeline and say, okay, I used to pray a lot here. I don't pray hardly at all here. Somewhere in between, something happened that got in the way of my prayer life. What was it? Lord, show me. Ask God to show you, and He will. And get it out of your life. And get that prayer life back up. Same thing with your Bible reading. What gets in the way of you reading the Bible and hiding it in your heart? All those things. And those, I, I listed mainly those things because a lot of those things are what's going on in the body of Christ right now, hardcore. What's really affecting and hurting the body of Christ. And it's getting in the way of your hiding God's word in your heart and living it and, and praying your prayer life. You need to have a prayer life checklist. You see how bad it's getting out there. How's your prayer life? How's your prayer life going? Are you giving God thanks in all things? Are you giving Him glory in all things? Finally, the last part is watching. Number eight. The eighth command is watching for all saints. 
for all saints. When I watch to see what's going on out there, it motivates me to look for that blessed hope and live a life of Christ, and I can motivate you and say, hey, you see that's going on out there? The Bible said it's going to happen. Are you ready? That's what this whole study is about. Are you ready for the catching away of the body of Christ? Are you ready for Jesus to come back? He can come back any day now. Are you ready? I, I have to ask myself that. I have to go through the checklist. I've gone through the checklist. Now I'm pointing at you, brothers and Christ, saying, what about you? I'm trying to help you. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm not here to see you be, I, I want you to be destroyed. No, I want to see you built back up. If you've fallen flat on your face, I want to see you get back up. I don't want to see you destroyed. I want to see you get back up. That's the whole point of this. Okay. We're to watch. Watch, watch, watch. Okay. One of the things that we watch out for is false converts in wolves and sheep's clothing. Acts 20.28 20, says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves. Acts 20.28. 20, Sorry, I needed to pause there. Forgive me. I know I probably haven't paused all the time, but Acts 20.28. 20, it's getting to be a long study, but it's worth it. Acts 20.28. 20, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Okay, that's a command. Verse 29. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. You know how that is? I mean, we got the internet today, but I've noticed men that when they're in ministry, that when they die, the wolves come running in to try to scatter the flock. Back in the old days when you didn't have internet and you had men come together, when you had men that were there preaching every week and they say, well, I'm going to go over here for a few months. When they're gone for a few months, that's when Satan tries to pounce because the sheep are so dependent on a shepherd. And the number one shepherd you're supposed to be dependent on is Jesus Christ. But it likens us as pastors and preachers and teachers as shepherds. Okay, and the shop, the flock, sheep are so dependent on a, on a shepherd. I tell you that this is the final authority, and that Jesus is the final authority. I also got to understand that Paul just said we set the example that you're to follow. I understand that whole point that I need to be setting the example that the brethren need to be following. But my example better line up with this, because this is the ultimate example. Jesus is the ultimate shepherd. If I'm not following him as as a good shepherd, you're to follow him over me. Period. But Paul's like, For this I know that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves. So you got wolves in sheep's clothing you're supposed to watch out for. False convert, wolves in sheep's clothing. But as we see here, you're also supposed to watch out for each other, brethren, that have fallen away. Notice it says here, also of your own selves. So you have lost people, wolves and sheep's clothing coming in, and then you have brethren of your own selves shall man arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. you got men among yourselves that will get prideful. They get puffed up. They start perverting the scriptures. That whole verse about gold and silver, wood and earth, some to honor, some to dishonor, is because you had two brethren that Paul named. He doesn't always name everybody, but sometimes he names them, that turn their back on, on the resurrection. They turn their back on tr absolute truth of your own selves. There's brethren that will fall away and give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. They'll turn their back. I know brethren that, that I've tr loved, they've, they've taught me so much that they're slowly turning their back on absolute truth. Of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch... So we got the word, watch, and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. That's what I do, brothers of Christ, in these last days. It just seems like, I don't, you don't see me tearing up, but when I pray, there's times where I do get tears when I'm praying for the brother, brethren out there. Night and day with tears. Lord, I see how bad it's getting out there. Brethren are starting to fall away. They're not looking for that blessed hope anymore. They're starting to hold traditions of men above the Word of God, culture, heritage. They're trying to pervert liberty and using it as an occasion to the flesh to justify sin. They're turning their back on um, the true plan of salvation. 
They're turning their back on uh, this book being God's perfect written book. They still like the King James Bible, but now they believe you can use any book you want so they can be part of that group that they're using. You just keep they're, they're falling away. Someone's coming in and talking them out of their faith in this book and the things of this book. And they're going the way of the world. Every night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace. It's right here. Which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. Two parts there. Build you up. That's my whole point. You use the word of God to encourage the brethren and build them back up. Not feelings and opinions. Not worldliness. We use God's word to encourage you. This whole study is to build you back up, brothers and sisters Christ, if you've fallen down. To build you back up. That's the whole point. And give you an inheritance among them that are sanctified. Remember, there's rewards and there's inheritance. Those are two different things. Inheritance has to do with if you suffer with Jesus Christ, you shall also reign with Jesus Christ. You stop suffering for Jesus Christ when you start compromising the word of God so you can get along with the world and do things the world's way. You start compromising the Word of God, and you stop suffering for Jesus Christ when you start conforming to your flesh's way to please your flesh. That's the inheritance that it's talking about. It's not talking about rewards. You can't lose rewards in heaven. You can get very little rewards. You can miss out on opportunity to get rewards. But your inheritance you can lose. You want to be able to come back down with Jesus Christ at the thousand year, at the day of the Lord and rule and reign with Him for a thousand years? Then you have to suffer for Jesus Christ. And suffering for Jesus Christ means that you obey this book and you live it and you keep your eyes on Jesus Christ and no matter what it costs you, wives, husbands, sons, daughters, family, friends, the easy life versus a hard life, you have to live a hard life instead of the easy life. If you just compromise a little bit, you can have an easy life. No. Putting the flesh down every day as you suffer. I'm getting, like I told you, I got so frustrated with the Lord. It's like this body of flesh. I'm one minute I'm thinking of something good and true. And it's a great thing. And the next, the Bible, and the next minute, I'm off thinking about some movie or tel a TV show or video game. And I'm like, how does it, oh, I'm just so sick and tired of this flesh. i got to keep putting it down. I look forward to the day that we're done with this body of flesh. 1 Peter 5, 8. We're supposed to watch out for false converts. We're supposed to watch out for brethren that are falling away. To encourage them to get back on the right track. Okay. Uh, 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. Okay, these wolves in sheep's clothing, they're all servants of Satan. These men that once stood for the truth and I believe are saved, they're starting to fall away. They're starting to... I don't know how else to say it. They're starting to work for Satan. They're not purposely trying to do it, but because they've turned away from the truth, they're actually helping out Satan. The world, remember, he's the lowercase g God of this world. We're supposed to be sober, we're supposed to be vigilant. When you have someone that turns their back on the imminent return of Jesus Christ, they're not a good steward of the scriptures. And they're helping Satan when he starts promoting him, or anybody, starts promoting that you take your eyes off Jesus Christ and that blessed hope. The imminent return, it's not going to happen. Just focus on what's going on in the world and start... Can, uh, start setting up your life based on what's going on in the world. Not what's, what this book says, but what's going on in the world. Be very careful. We're supposed to be sober. We're supposed to be vigilant. Satan's always going to try to sneak people in. There's people that I've warned brethren about that were snakes. They snuck in and said, I'm one of you, and they're not. They were snakes. They came in to scatter the flock, to mess brethren up. That's one of the things we're supposed to be watching for. That's why 1 Timothy 3.10 for a bishop says, A bishop must then be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, and it keeps going on and on. But the word we're looking for is vigilant. When you have a bishop, and I'm not a bishop, and if anybody's just doing ministry online, they're not a bishop either. A bishop is someone who has a physical flock there. It's either a house church, you could have a workshop where everybody meets on a property, 
meeting house, but you have a physical flock there that you are responsible for. You're to watch out for them. You're supposed to be vigilant. Okay? Now, when we do online ministries and we're preaching the word, we can also do the same thing here. We try to warn the brethren. I point to the computer, but up there. We're trying to warn the brethren. Be vigilant. Watch out for false teachers and uh, false ministries and worldliness and everything. And things going on in the world. And they're trying to claim that it's a Christ Christian movement. And it's a Christian thing. And we're getting... We're becoming more Christian and gaining more, and it's all garbage. We are supposed to be vigilant. We're all supposed to warn. But I use this because that actually says it in the Bible for a bishop. Okay? But it also says that we're supposed to be sober and be vigilant, period, as brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ, period. We're supposed to warn the brethren. Okay? So we watch for false converts. We watch for fallen Christians to help them get back up. And if they refuse to get back up, you treat them like wolves in sheep's clothing. Right? We watch out for Satan. And the way of the, the world trying to creep in and trying to get you to go its way and do its thing. Remember, Satan's the lowercase g God of this world. Okay, we're supposed to watch out for each other. Right? Not just for fallen brethren in ministry that are fallen, but brethren as a whole. We're supposed to watch out for brothers and sisters in Christ. 1 Corinthians 6.13 says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men, be strong, let your things be done with charity. Watch, stand fast in the faith. Ephesians 6.18 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. For all the saints. When you see what's going on out in the world, and we let you know, hey, this bad thing's going on out here, are you ready? Are you focused? Are you living for Jesus Christ? So we're watching out for wolves in sheep's clothing, men in ministry that have fallen, to try to say, hey, you need to get back on the right path. We watch each other. We watch out for Satan and his, the ways of the world trying to creep in and trying to change how we're supposed to live. We're not supposed to let that happen. So we keep an eye out on the world. Okay. We also watch for open doors to preach the truth, the gospel of our salvation. It's another thing we're supposed to be watching for. Colossians 4.2 says, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all prayer also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. We pray for open doors, and we watch for open doors. Okay. When a door opens to preach the gospel, we're to walk through. And you preach the gospel. Lord, give me courage. Lord, give me boldness to preach the truth to people. When God opens doors, we're to walk through them. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of hope that is in you in the meekness of fear. You say, this is the third time. <laughs> Absolutely. Reason of the hope. The hope. We're supposed to be looking for that hope. That's another thing we're supposed to be watching out for. When you're looking for Jesus to come back every day, you're doing it with the life that you're living. We're supposed to watch. See how bad it's getting out there? Jesus is coming back. It could be any day now. I need to get busy for the Lord. Titus 2.13 says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Looking, not believing. Looking. 2 Timothy 4.1 says, I charge thee before men. Before God, I'm sorry. 2 Timothy 4.1 I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Catch away the body of Christ, his appearing at his kingdom at the end of the thousand year reign. He's going to be the great white throne, be judging everybody there too. Two times the Lord is judging. Two, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Okay, you're to look for these things. You're supposed to be instant in season. And when you're out of season, you're still supposed to do it. Okay? 
You're supposed to preach the word, whether it is the season or whether it's out of season. You're to preach the word. You're to reprove. You're to rebuke. You're to exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they shall not endure sound doctrine. And we're seeing that today. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. One of the big fables that came out recently that I heard a brother talking about is that the um, day of the Lord already happened in the past. That's a fable. Right? You want to know what another fable is? When someone says that Jesus, Jesus is not coming back for five or six years, it's a fable. The Bible doesn't say when he's coming back. We're supposed to live every day as if he could come back today. Be careful. There's a lot of fables going on out there. Okay? Uh, this book is not God's perfect written word. And they've got all these fables and stories to prove it when they're not proving anything. It's a fable. Be careful. But watch thou. But watch thou. In all things, endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. For men in ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul saying, I, I, I'm going to be beheaded. I wanted to live to see the catching away of the body of Christ, but I don't think it's going to happen, because they're saying a, a week from today, I'm using this as an example. Okay, the Bible doesn't say this, but it's like, they're saying a week from now I'm going to be beheaded. So I'm writing these letters real quick. They're saying I'm, I'm going to be killed. However it is that they killed Paul. I'm going to be killed in a week. Okay, I need to write these letters out. My time is, at, is coming to an end. doesn't mean he wasn't looking present tense for that blessed hope. It just means that they said they're going to kill him in a week. And if God tarries, I'm going to be gone in a week. Okay. I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Brothers and sisters in Christ and everything that we've talked about here, have you done that? Have you fought the good fight? Have you finished your course? You put on the whole armor of God. Are you obeying all eight commands that God gives you. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me on that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. It's hard to see somebody loving his appearing if they keep putting off his appearing. Oh, he's not coming back till next year. Next year comes around, oh, he's not coming out till next year. And they just keep putting it off and putting it off. Oh, that's not someone who loves his appearing. Someone who loves his appearing is always saying, he could come back today. What can I get done for you today, Lord? I want you to come back today, Lord. Please, can today be the day? But until it happens, Lord, what do you need me to do for you today? Do you love his appearing? Are you watching for it? We're supposed to watch. But brothers and sisters Christ, when we watched, turn to Revelation chapter 3 verse 1. I want to turn to this one. Turn to Revelation chapter 3 verse 1. When you're watching anything in this world, when you're looking at brethren that fall away, they're setting bad examples, that's supposed to encourage you not to do that. When you have brethren who are setting good examples, it's to encourage you to continue doing what's right. Okay? When you see what's going on in the world, it's encouraged you to stay focused on the Lord and living for the Lord. He could come back any day now. Revelation 3. Revelation 3, 1. And unto the angel of the church of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. Be watchful. What's the, what's the mean by art dead? Thou livest, they're saved, but they're dead. What happened? Let's keep reading. Be watchful. We're supposed to watch everything that's going on in the world. It's okay to look every once in a while. I look. But the whole point of looking and being watchful on all those things that I mentioned, all those people we're supposed to watch, wolf in sheep's clothing, men in ministry that fall, uh, that have fallen away, uh, each other, okay, um, for that blessed hope. We do all these things. Why? Why the whole point of being watchful? When you're on post, you're guard on duty, you're watching to see if anything's going wrong and to make sure you're doing what's right. When you see what's going wrong, you make sure you're not following it. 
If it's going right, then yours should already be following it to begin with. If you're not, then you need to fix yourself and make sure you're following what's right. But you're watching. It says here, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. That's why he said that thou, art, thou, art, that thou livest but art dead. You have some Christians that are amounting to nothing. I say Christians, but uh, saved sinners. Brothers and sisters in Christ that get saved, they start out hardcore on fire for the Lord, and they die out and fizzle out, and they just the world. They start trying to resurrect the old man, and they're just worthless Christians, worthless brethren. Okay, they they have this thing that they liveth. They have that has the name that thou livest, but art dead. And then we get warned right here. But watch and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Why is the number one reason why we watch, brothers, says Christ? So we can strengthen the things that remain. When you're putting on the whole armor of God, when you're taking this word and you're hiding your heart, we're supposed to be strengthening those things. We see what we're watching. We're being vigilant. Be sober. Be vigilant for your adversary, the devil, go around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. We're trying to be sober. We're trying to be vigilant. We're trying to watch. We're trying to be on guard to protect ourselves, to protect the brethren. Why? So we can strengthen the things that remain. When you stop being watchful or you get distracted by what's going on, you're not watching in the right way. You're not watching to make sure you're doing what's right according to the Word of God. And you're watching the world and you're comparing it to the Scriptures. You're just watching the world to watch the world. What happens? Things start dying. People start losing their faith in this book. They start losing their faith in the doctrines. They start losing the faith in the blessed hope. They start going back to letting the flesh run things. Verse 3, remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast. Thou hast received and heard, hold fast. You were once at a standing point and you start watching and you're not comparing it to how you're standing. Okay, am I standing right? You start watching everything and you stop looking at how you're standing and you fall down. It's ready to die. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast. Oh, oh I need to get back up. You fall down and you look at the world and you're like, wait a second. The world looks like I look. Lord, help me. Okay, now I'm different than the world. Now I'm set apart from the world. Oh, Lord, I'm looking like the world again. Thank you, Lord. You see how it works? That's why you watch. Am I looking like the world? Am I acting like the world? Am I becoming like the world? I'm supposed to be set apart from the Lord. Am I a light for you? Is my, is my light fizzling? Is that candle about to go out? Am I trying to hide that candle under a bushel? No. So you know that one in the Bible. Hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is... Jesus, when he comes back, he's, I believe he's going to catch a lot of you off guard, brothers and sisters. If you're starting to get distracted by this world, he's going to come and catch you off guard. And he's going to take you by surprise. And you're going to be like in this kind of a position, flat on your face. And you're going to be like, Lord, uh, let me try to get up. Let me try. It's like, nope, too late. You're going up like that. If you're saved, you're sealed into the very day of redemption. You're going up. But you didn't watch properly. And you're flat on your face. And you're going to go up like that. Is that how you want Jesus to find you? I believe he's going to catch a lot of you off guard. Don't get me wrong. He might, like right now I'm doing this video, he might call us home. And I'm going to be, I'm going to be like, what Lord? What Lord? It's not because he caught me off guard. I'm always looking every day. It's not going to be a huge shock. Now, Lord, you're coming now. But I'm not ready, Lord. It's, I won't be like that. I pray I'm never like that. But there's times where it's, I need to get my life right with the Lord. I'm starting to backpedal. Like I said, there's days that I'm like, I'm ready. And then there's days like, I got some work to do. Some serious, we always have work to do for the Lord, but I got some serious cleaning to do. I've started to backpedal a little bit. I've been distracted. 
But he's going to come on some of these people that flat out turn their back on the imminent return of Jesus Christ and they keep putting it off. Oh, it's not going to happen for another three or four years. And, and, I'm, and they're not looking. They're actually not looking for that blessed hope. He's going to catch them by surprise. A great example of this is you remember Paul, what Paul said to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians? 2 Corinthians 12, 20. 2 Corinthians 12, 20. For I fear lest when I come shall not find you such as I would. When we just read there in Revelation, when Jesus comes back, he will not find them as he would. I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. He's going to catch him by surprise and not find you as he would. When Jesus comes back, is he going to find you in the standing? As you would, as he as he would, or is he going to find you like this, brothers and sisters? Christ, Paul says it to the Corinthians: For I fear lest when I come I shall not find you such as I would. Living for the Lord, sanctification, being a light to the world, being set apart from he won't find him as he would. He's going to find him acting in the way they did before they got saved. They're looking and acting like the world, and they're lost. Acting like they're lost. Not all of them, but some of them I believe were false converts. But For I fear lest when I come I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as you would not. Paul said, I set the example. Where Paul says that we're all supposed to be of the same mind, the same judgment. We're supposed to be striving together. Same mind, same judgment, striving together. Okay, We're supposed to be the body of Christ. One church, which is the body of Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ. But Paul's like, I come to you and you're going to look at me like I'm some foreign man because you're not living like the life of a Christian. The life of Christ. You're not living like someone who's born again. So I'm going to look foreign to you. And you're going to look foreign to me. That I shall be found unto you such as ye would not, lest there be debates. Envyings, wrath, strife, backbiting, whispering, swellings, tumults. Does that sound familiar lately online? I'm pointing at my computer now. Does that sound a lot like what's going on a lot in the comment sections of different ministries online? Some Bible believing, some are fake. Does that sound like what's going on? Some people have ministries that are based off of this stuff. Backbiting, in. Uh, debates, envies, wrath, strife, backbiting, whispering, swelling, tumults. Brother Chris Christ, we're not supposed to be like that. And lest, when I come again, my God will humble me among you. This is Paul once again saying, remember what he taught? In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. You can get mad about something at first, but you need to calm down when it comes to correcting somebody. Unless my God will humble me among you, that I shall be well many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. Okay? It's a sad thing when you see a brother in Christ fall. I'm not happy about correcting brethren. I correct you because I'm sorrowful about the state that you're in. And vice versa, when you correct me, you're sorrowful about the state that I'm in. I want to see you get built back up. And if you're going to correct me, it's to build me back up. So your words will, 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 how you come across will determine whether you're trying to build someone back up or if you're just trying to destroy them completely. Will Jesus, okay, sum this back up now, we're at the end. Will Jesus, when he comes back, brother, sister Christ, because he's coming back any day now, Will Jesus look at you and say, well done, thou good and faithful one? Is he going to catch you off guard, find you flat on your face? Or is he going to find you in a standing position? That's the first thing. And when we get caught up and you're standing before Jesus Christ, will he say, well done, thou good and faithful one? You've fought the good fight? You've finished your course? You've kept the faith? Or is he going to look at you and say, you started out strong, but you, you fizzled out there towards the end. You really fell flat on your face and you really screwed up. Here's your pen. Brothers and sisters of Christ, this is a checklist. Make sure you're going through this checklist often. It seems like I'm going through it a lot more and more in these last days. You know, there was times where 
the world as a whole love their good morals, but where they get their good morals from here, but they didn't want to give God credit for it. Now they've departed a lot from that period. Their so-called good morals are gone. And it's all 100% against this book. And in these last days, we've really got to do that checklist, Brother Sis Christ, and we've got to keep checking. Lord, am I putting on the whole armor of God? Lord, am I praying? Am I praying without ceasing? Am I praying about everything and anything, Lord? Am I watching? And am I watching with the intent to strengthen the things that remain? Not getting distracted by watching to pull me away and to let these things die. Am I watching what's going on in the body of Christ, in my life, your personal life, what's going on in the world? Am I doing all this watching so that I can strengthen the things that remain? Or am I letting these things die and getting distracted? Brothers and sisters in Christ, we are in the last days. I know you hear this a lot. Some of the brethren are old and they've been saved for like 30 or 40, 50, 60 years. And they're like, I've heard this for 50. We are in the last days. Remember the day uh, to the Lord, a day is as a thousand days and a thousand days is as a, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. Okay? Please, please, don't lose faith that Jesus is coming back any day now. Don't lose faith. Don't turn your back on it. Live for Jesus Christ every day. That's my prayer for you. Please pray for one another. Keep going through these checklists. This is just one checklist um, of, of a few checklists that the Bible gives us. Okay, There's checklists for you as an individual. There's a checklist for how you look for that blessed hope. Okay, There's a checklist for, hey, am I truly saved? You know? Did I truly get, because if someone tries to get you to doubt your salvation, there's a checklist you can go through and say, hey, am I truly saved? Yeah, I am. I'm sealed. No one's going to take that from me. Yeah. There's all these checklists that we need to be going through hardcore, brother and sister Christ. Don't become part of the falling away. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Be sober. Be vigilant. Put on the whole armor of God. Taking off your helmet, it's going to hurt. The rest, it's going to take off so much as one piece of the armor of God. Oh, I can enjoy sin for a season, so I can take off this breastplate of righteousness and look like the world and start representing the world and, and enjoy sin for a season. No, you can't. You have to have the whole armor of God on for it to work. You have to have all of it on. Please, brother, says Christ, please, please, please keep the whole armor of God on. Make sure that it's polished, it's good, your sword is sharp. Remember, it's a double-edged sword. It cuts both ways, that when you're using it, that it could come back and cut you if you're not careful. Be careful. Right? I love my brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm doing this out of love. So I'll say it again. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and making it all the way through this video if you did. And I will see you in the next study.